Thanks for sharing, Peter. Okay, we are recording right now. Um, Peter, if you'd like to take it away. Uh, due to David's location, I am going to be chairing this meeting. And, you know, I'd love nothing more than my last meeting to be a participatory team effort amongst all of you. If there's anything you think I'm missing or in my exuberance of my last meeting, I'm forgetting, particularly as we have uh, a new item here in that we have an interpreter. So um, uh, that's new to me. I think it's great. So I call to order uh, this meeting. Uh, we have uh, a quorum. We, we do, do we do a roll call, Cindy? Um, no, we don't need to um, because we are a video board. Okay. Well, then I'm gonna hand it to Jean or Cindy uh, Jean. to take us, Jean, to please take us through the, uh, the opening. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. As you mentioned, we will have the interpretation function tonight. Um, so I would like to ask folks to hover uh, at the top or the bottom of their screen. Cindy will turn on the interpretation function and you will have a choice of English or Spanish. I'm gonna remind folks to please do that um, because then even if you're um, choosing English, then you will be able to hear the interpreter uh, provide the, um, the interpreted Spanish when our Spanish speakers um, are sharing. This is gonna be a challenge for all of us. We'll have to remind each other frequently to speak slowly and clearly pronounce words. Um, please not to interrupt each other. Um, if we have headsets, that's useful to use. And to, again, select the language. Um, we have been working, on, and I'm sure Kathleen has uh, worked this into the presentation, but I think for all of us um, with the comments to try to be as clear with our language as possible. So Cindy, with that, I think you can turn on the interpretation and folks should have the ability to choose. Um, question on that, do I, I clicked on the interpretation at the bottom and it looks like folks can just choose English or Spanish at the bottom. I don't have a way to actually turn it on. Um, is there an enable or a start? No, there is not. I'm not seeing that yet. Um, I apologize, folks. Um, I think it is on. I know I that see this it is as Kathleen, well. yeah, I do have the option. Okay, then it's going. Okay. You Did you see the note that Letty is having trouble getting in? Oh. Oh, there she is. I, I apologize. Let me promote, promote Letty. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, I will go back to sharing screen and finish the protocol. So um, the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and council, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. You can find more about this on the council pages for meeting protocol. Oops. The following are examples of rules of decorum that will be held during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other, other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, dehumanizing language, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts 
or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. And we ask folks that are, um, would like to address the board under open comment or the public hearing to please display their whole name. Currently we are having audio testimony and not video testimony. So when we get to the open comment or the public hearing, we will be using the raise hand function at the bottom or the top of your screen. Also that we have the chat disabled. If you have questions about the technical aspects of the meeting, you can put them in the Q&A. We ask that you not include questions related to the content of the matter. The board members are not, whoops, I'm gonna jump ahead. The board members are not, um, board members and the rest of staff are not following the Q&A and um, it's not part of the record. So it can't be, um, we, we ask that, that any content related questions are raised only during the public hearing. With that, Peter, I will turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Jean. And I want to congratulate you on your career and service and wish you the best in retirement. Thank you for taking such great care of us here. Thank you, Peter. Not retiring, just leaving the city. I'll be <laughs> some next chapter. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, we have minutes to approve, Cindy. Yes, we do. Um, we have minutes from February 3rd and March 17th, which were sent out to the board for edits. I received a few edits back from some of you. And um, so leave it in your hands to approve. Great. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion to approve uh, the minutes? May we do both at once, Cindy? Absolutely. Okay. I'll make a motion. Okay. Motion to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? John, seconded. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Wonderful. That is everyone. Has everyone has has approved the minutes? I would now like to move on to public partic participation uh, for matters not currently on our agenda, which uh, we have one agenda item now. Uh, for the East Boulder subcommunity plan. So I would like to pass it over to Cindy to open uh, the public participation period of the meeting, please. If we indeed have anyone. Yes, if anyone would like to speak tonight regarding anything that is not on the agenda, which means anything not related to the East Boulder subcommunity plan, now would be your time to raise your hand, excuse me, Oops, um, you would need to go down to the bottom and hover over the raise hand function and click on that. How and it doesn't look like we have anyone calling in on their telephone. So if you click on raise hand, then you will get three minutes to speak about anything other than the East Boulder sub community plan. And we will call on you. And I'm watching to see if I see any hands go up. It's a little quiet. <laughs> All right. Well, I've noted that our yeah. public screen item is expansive enough oh, to contain. We did get a hand. Uh, I apologize for interrupting you, Peter. Um, um, looks like we have Lynn Siegel who would like to speak. And I'm going to unmute her. And then we will give you three minutes. So you should be able to unmute yourself. Lynn Siegel, I have no prepared speech. I wish I could yell as loud, actually 50 times louder than I yelled last time. Because every time I yell, it doesn't matter. And when I'm nice, it doesn't matter either. So let's do something about this affordable housing issue. This is utterly ridiculous. I've been going through my records for my uh, Board of Assessment Appeals protest. And you know what? You actually get threatened with a higher amount than the NOV, that is the notice of valuation, if you lose at the Board of Assessment Appeals. This is absolutely insane. Go look at the assessor's records. These prices are going up like you can never, ever catch up, ever pray to. 
in any condition, under any circumstances, with any amount of LIHTC funding. And guess what? You're losing LIHTC funding. It's going down. It's going away. You know, in Korea itself, South Korea, there was an election based on this affordable housing issue in South Korea. So it's not just Boulder. It's not the county. It's not the nation. It's international. Stop it here. You know, we haven't got any more money for subsidizing developers in this town. We, you know, we got the other day, we got some concession by Biden. But then on the other hand, yeah, oh, oh, I know, I know what it is. Yeah, that hundred million dollars, if you have, you know, assets of that, you have to pay more tax. But guess what? The same day, we got a pile more money into the war of Ukraine or whatever wars, it doesn't matter. You know what? Because we are still in World War I. Like Ukraine's new, the only difference is they're white people with, with teddy bears and rabbits and little kids that, that looks good on paper for, for you know, death and destruction as compared to the other countries, you know, like Africa that we cause wars in all over, all the time, constantly. This is what you, directly are dealing with at the planning board in Boulder, in the city. You have to deal with this board. You have to deal with all of this or we're going to have nothing left here. I'm going to fight my taxes, but you know what? It's a million plus three, four. I heard there's a $6 million place in trail, trail, what do you call it? Up the hill from 311. You know, this is outrageous. I can fight it and fight it and fight it. And guess what? I'm the biggest number one is the biggest number and I'm gonna do it, but I'd sure like to have your help. I'd sure like to have your help. Stop subsidizing Marpa House, God forbid. My brother lived there for nine years. Now he can't live in Boulder, period. What are you doing to this town? Totally whitewashing it? See you South, no friggin' way. I can't yell loud enough. I wish I had more voice. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I just want to say that in five years, you've made a lot of really great points. And I think you have a great sense of humor. And I absolutely guarantee you that when you're not yelling and when you are, quote, nice, not that you need to be nice, uh, I hear you a lot, a lot better. I hear you crystal clear. So for what it's worth, I've enjoyed the, um, you're like a, you're like the fifth beetle here with us. and. Uh, I would say that your points are valid. And when you're not yelling, I certainly hear them. So thank you for your participation. I, would, I wanna just make one comment that um, I'm going to start giving warnings about the yelling. Um, it has come up. And um, so if the yelling continues, I'm gonna have to start taking a break and just let people cool down a little bit. And then we can start again and you'll still have your remainder of your time, but I have had requests that we need to just cool down a little bit, so. Thank you, Cindy. So I do not believe we have any dispositions planned or call up to continuations tonight. We do not. No, we do not. Well, wonderful. Well, I'm very excited we're gonna have such a focused conversation on the uh, East Boulder sub-community plan, so. I would like to hand it over to Jean to set us up for this. Thank you. Actually, Kathleen will be heading the presentation. Thank you. Hello, Kathleen King um, from Planning. I'm going to um, go through a presentation, so I will share my screen. Let's see and share. Okay, you can see it. Okay, great. Well, good evening and um, thank you so much for having us tonight. We're really excited to share the latest draft of the East Boulder SUP community plan and hear your feedback. Um, this is a really important plan for the community and it's been an exciting project to work on with planning board over the past three years. So um, we're looking forward to the discussion tonight. So we've got a busy agen agenda. Um, actually, we're gonna, first we'll do a staff presentation and I'll be joined by my colleagues, 
Jean Sanson from Transportation and, and Jean Gatza. And then we have five working group members with us tonight who will share a bit about their experiences working on the project and thoughts on the outcomes of the process. And then um, after we hear from those working group members, we can go through any clarifying questions that planning board may have for staff or working group members. And then um, planning board will hold the public hearing and then host a discussion of the key questions and provide feedback on the plan. So um, let's get started. I just I just wanted to bring up, you know, East Boulder subcommunity plan is only the second plan of this scale that the city has ever done. The last subcommunity plan was the North Boulder plan, which was completed in the 90s, and we are still working on implementation of recommendations from the North Boulder subcommunity plan. So um, you might think of things like the North Boulder Library or upgrades to North Broadway. Those are still going on, and, and we would expect a similar timeline for implementation of the East Boulder plan and anticipate that change in this area is going to happen gradually over the next 20 years. So subcommunity plans are part of the city's suite of tools to help us implement the broad goals of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan at the neighborhood level. Once a subcommunity plan is adopted, it will help guide changes to development standards and zoning and inform planning and funding of our capital improvement program for years to come. This project's been going on for three years. Um, we kicked off the planning process in 2019 and went through a series of tasks. First, conducting an inventory and analysis to really understand what the existing conditions of the subcommunity are, and then coming up with ideas for potential changes to the area, testing the outcomes of those changes, and developing strategies for future implementation. We were last with planning board in July to review and discuss the 60% draft plan. So today we're, we're nearing completion of the plan and looking for your feedback to help refine recommendations and complete the project. We've had excellent participation by the community throughout the process. Over 23 different engagement events and opportunities, um, 24 actually I think after, after yesterday's community meeting. Um, and the process has also been guided by a working group of 21 community members who have met 30 times over the last three years to help shape recommendations of the plan and communicate the project out to the community. Today, we're still hoping to get more feedback on the recommendations. There's a community questionnaire on beheardboulder.org that will be available through April 4 for community members to submit feedback on the plan. So I'm gonna walk through the plan and um, some of the anticipated outcomes and we'll be looking for planning board feedback on these key questions during our discussion. So let's get into the actual plan. Um, for, for those um, calling in that, that might be new to the project, the East Boulder subcommunity is located north of Arapahoe and east of Foothills Parkway and includes some key community assets like Belmont City Park and Boulder Community Health Foothills Campus along with a lot of light industrial businesses and office parks. And we've seen some recent change in the area. Our charge with this project was to create a plan with the community to help manage that change and deliver outcomes that are important to Boulder. The vision for East Boulder is to evolve into a thriving industrial area with interesting places to work, live, play, and do business. This will be achieved by integrating diverse housing and retail options into existing industrial areas. New connections, enhancements to our current transportation network and other mobility improvements will make getting around without a car much easier. We've heard strong support from community members for 15 minute walkable neighborhoods. The plan accomplishes this with key land use changes that will allow for a better mix of uses including housing. We've heard some people are concerned about increased traffic congestion. The plan outlines different strategies to manage future demand on roadways in East Boulder. And we've heard that the plan should provide details about how all of this will happen. The plan also includes an implementation section where policies, projects, and programs offer a path to realization of the plan's vision over the next several years. There are four major components of the East Boulder plan, a land use plan, a connections plan, 
a recommendation section outlining those policies, programs, and projects I mentioned. And then finally, the 55th and Arapaho Station Area Plan. This document offers more detailed recommendations for one of the key areas of change in East Boulder. So um, we're gonna walk through these different sections to give you a sense of what can be found in the plan and where you might look for some key topics of interest. So we'll start Kathleen, with the land use plan. Yes. Kathleen, sorry to interrupt. Just a quick pace check. Slower, I'm sorry. Sorry, interpreters. Okay. So we will start with the land use plan. And um, the recommendations for land use include changes to the current BVCP land use map. So that's a Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan land use map. Approximately 250 acres that are currently designated as light industrial are proposed to change to mixed use neighborhoods. This modification will bring new opportunities for integrating residential, commercial, and retail spaces and places with existing subcommunity businesses and workplaces. The plan also makes some modifications that will better align the BVCP land use map with existing conditions, protect small business space through community industrial designations and identify important natural areas and wetlands with environmental preservation designations. At the 60% draft, council asked the staff team and working group to consider expansion of the mixed use industrial designation to a couple of locations, including the area south of Pearl Street and an area north of Flatirons Golf Course. After carefully considering these changes and asking the community about these options and potential outcomes, the plan maintains industrial uses in these areas to retain business space, avoid key impacts to the floodplain and concentrate change in key areas. So the section of the plan also looks at um, each of the proposed areas of change to describe how these areas might evolve in the future and what some key features of each neighborhood might include. One such area is the San Lazaro mobile home community. The plan recommends annexation of this site into the city. The community includes 213 homes and approximately 500 people live in this area. The land use map describes a lot of changes to mixed use neighborhoods. Feedback from planning board and many community members described a desire for more detailed guidance on what those neighborhoods should include and what they look like. The place type section of the plan provides that additional guidance and will help inform any future zoning changes we make to these areas of change. The next major component is the connections plan and Jean Sanson's gonna walk walk us through some of the key features of this section. Thank you, Kathleen. So today, East Boulder is an area that over the years, as we know, has largely been designed for motor vehicles. And options to travel by any mode other than a vehicle are fairly limited. And these dispersed patterns of development have grown up around the car, and therefore the street blocks are typically long and disconnected. But as land uses change, as described by Kathleen, and infill and redevelopment bring a greater mix of jobs and housing to the area, the transportation network and the mobility options should evolve to support this, transfer this transformation. Supporting the network of businesses and new residents that Kathleen has described includes some major recommendations that will contribute to our access and mobility goals. So to that end, this chapter of the plan supports the vision and the land use plan while also responding to the many community comments we have received about transportation needs and recommended upgrades in the area. So let's start with the connections plan that you're looking at here. New connections are intended to support new land uses by first, improving access into and through these redevelopment areas, second, expanding the pedestrian and bicycle network in the subcommunity, and thirdly, creating opportunities for street activation and vibrancy in these evolving neighborhoods. And the recommendation of the connections plan should look pretty consistent with what was included in the 60% draft. In response to feedback that we received from planning board back in July, we've updated our map to simplify recommendations and show the full system of proposed improvements. 
So what you're looking at is how the proposed connections are integrated into the existing network of roads and pedestrian and bicycle facilities throughout the subcommunity. Next slide, Kathleen. Thank you. In the map you see here, the geographic extent of each, each new connection is described, or I should say in the text, the purpose or intent of the new connection and the street types as identified in, a design, in our design and construction standards. The plan will be incorporated into our transportation master plan and replace portions of earlier network plans that cover East Boulder. Transportation improvements included in the connections plan will be installed by property owners as part of redevelopment and through city capital projects. For the new connections, we took another look at the stamp in particular to identify opportunities for more grade separated routes as per planning board and TABS recommendations and have included additional recommendations along Western Avenue and Rain Street. Next slide, please. Thank you. Another component of the transportation chapter is what we refer to as system enhancements. These are transportation network improvements that are recommended for consideration in the next TMP update to improve existing travel for all modes. The enhancements range in scale from completing missing sidewalks to initiating design of the 55th Street corridor to incorporate protected bicycle facilities. You'll also notice that in response to planning board's feedback, we did build out our recommendations for mobility hubs throughout the subcommunity and provided some additional guidance on areas that would be well served by various scales of mobility hubs. Next slide, please. This and just another pace, pace check. Thank you, Jean. This next set of projects for future study may be located outside the areas of change in East Boulder, but have been identified by community members throughout the process and city staff as potential projects warranting further study for future consideration or investment. Following adoption of the subcommunity plan, these projects should be tracked to, de to determine when and how they're incorporated into future city department's work plans. So for example, preliminary engineering for the East Arapahoe corridor is a project that CDOT is initiating this year. While the potential for a fast tracks Northwest rail station at 55th Street is something we have heard as a desire from our community members, and which we will continue to examine as rail discussions with RTD proceed. With that, I'll hand this back over to Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. So the next piece of the plan, um, this, this section outlines recommendations for policies, programs, and projects that will help implement each of our plan's goals for access and mobility, arts and culture, design quality and placemaking, housing affordability and diversity, resilience and climate commitment, and local business. So this is a new section that's been added since the 60% draft, and many of the initial ideas for this section came directly from our community members through the engagement process. The plan also outlines potential programs and projects, key steps towards implementation, and offers some guidance on prioritization. This tool will be used by city staff to develop future work plans, capital improvement planning, and develop partnerships throughout the community to implement these recommendations. The final major component of the subcommunity plan is the 55th and Arapahoe station area plan. This document provides greater detail for recommendations in this area of change. A regional mobility hub planned at 55th and Arapahoe will be served by high quality, high frequency bus rapid transit in the future as part of the State Highway 7 BRT project that the city's been working on in collaboration with CDOT, RTD, and our neighboring communities. The station area plan provides site-specific guidance on issues like redevelopment strategies, design characteristics, and building performance, new and enhanced connections, including recommendations for street design specific to each revised connection, and similarly offers an implementation matrix to help prioritize projects and realize the vision for this catalytic site. 
So um, those are the major components of the plan. But for this group, we also want to make sure that we review some of the anticipated impacts of the plan. At our last planning board um, session on this topic, there was a lot of discussion about impacts on the jobs to housing balance. So um, I'm going to walk through and, and we'll really focus our analysis on this issue. So it's important to review the city's policy on this topic because the comp plan policy is what guides our work in neighborhoods and at the sub community plan level. So the policy is Boulder is a major employment center with more jobs than housing for people who work here. This has resulted in both positive and negative impacts, including economic prosperity, significant in commuting, excuse me, and high demand on existing housing. The city will continue to be a major employment center and will seek opportunities to improve the balance of jobs and housing while maintaining a healthy economy. This will be accomplished by encouraging new housing in mixed use neighborhoods in areas close to where people work, encouraging transit oriented development in appropriate locations, preserving service commercial uses, converting commercial and industrial uses to residential uses in appropriate locations, improving regional transportation alternatives, and mitigating the impacts of traffic congestion. So this is what we're really working to implement. And it's important to understand, to understand um, that the policy does not describe a desired condition for a one job to one home scenario, but the policy does describe an approach to effectively maintain a healthy economy and to manage the impacts that come along with that. So I'm actually gonna walk through um, the pieces of this policy to describe how the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan implements this. So the first piece is about encouraging new housing and mixed use neighborhoods close to where people work. Recommended land use changes in design guidance for place types could allow for approximately 5,000 homes in East Boulder. We would conservatively anticipate that about a quarter of these homes would be permanently affordable. Taking a look at how that compares to what we might expect without these changes, it's a significant improvement in the number of housing units that the area could offer and the population that could be accommodated here. This change increases the total number of housing units in the city by 11% and the total number of affordable units by 32%. The next half of that is about where people work. So the land use plan maintains 31% of the area for general light and community industrial uses and designates about 19% for mixed use which would continue to allow for workspace. Um, I know that there is also a, a great desire for this group to get into the numbers on jobs. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. And you know, we note that today there are 17,666 jobs in East Boulder, and that's just jobs. So it doesn't necessarily mean that 17,666 people fill those jobs. Um, for instance, you can have one person that works two different jobs in the area. Um, but when we think about how land use changes impact jobs, it's really important to understand how we calculate, how we calculate that number. So I'm gonna try and, and walk you through this. When we do a projection of future jobs, that number does not actually represent a job or a person to fill that job. Job calculations are a measurement of space. We measure how much workspace is provided and then divide that amount by an average square foot per job metric. And that metric is you know, different for different types of space. So for instance, an, an industrial job has a higher square foot per job ratio than an office job. So that calculation is what gives us an estimate for potential number of jobs. So um, I'm going to demonstrate how that gets calculated at different scales during different phases of the project. So uh, we'll look at this parcel. Um, I just picked this one. This is, this is in the Park West neighborhood. It's located off of Sterling Drive. Um, it's a pretty typical shape, average-ish size, um, but it has a unique 
feature in the ditch that cuts across the southeast corner of the property. During the scenario testing phase of work, we provided a really coarse calculation for potential jobs in the area. And we projected 35,000 jobs for the entire subcommunity in a no change scenario. So again, that number was really a representation of space. And what we're looking at is that same parcel and the, um, the large blue box around the existing building. So the, the white box is the existing building. And now we're looking at the, um, this blue box here, big blue box. Um, that represents the build out for that parcel based on our current zoning. So that maximum build out for all 690 parcels in the subcommunity is what was used for the calculation during that phase of work. And you know the intention was not, not to freak people out, um, but to give folks just a sense of how workspace could be reallocated to other uses in different scenarios. But um, you know, if we look at this parcel, we know that what is being shown as potential workspace would never develop in that format. It doesn't consider parking needs. It doesn't accommodate that ditch or any of the required setbacks from that ditch. Um, so now as we kind of move our, our concepts and our planning forward, we're really taking a much more fine grain approach to understanding the workspace impacts of the plan's land uses and in particular, the place types. So this is again, um, that same parcel, and we've conceptually designed how the space might change under the proposed conditions. So this concept um, actually uses an adaptive reuse approach for the building. So the light purple on the ground floor is industrial space, and there's some commercial space in that orangish red. This is a, a mixed use building. And then above the ground floor, we have converted potential workspace to residential space. So the new numbers that I'm sharing use these refined concepts for each of the areas of change and offer an interpretation of the workspace that might be provided in these areas. So in the Park West neighborhood, we're anticipating 375 new jobs. And then to compare that to new homes in the area, we're looking at 1,300. So that, that, that um, new jobs number is just new jobs generated from redevelopment. It doesn't represent the total number of jobs in that neighborhood. In Park East, it's 125 new jobs along the 55th Street corridor in Flatiron Business Park. The concept includes 200 new jobs. And at the stamp, there is workspace for 2,000 jobs. But again, these job numbers really represent space. And as we continue to come out of the pandemic and um, different businesses retool how they accommodate people and employees, these numbers will certainly change. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be questions about that, but I want to um, get through the rest of the important impacts so we can make sure and, and hear from our working group members. So um, the next concept in, in the policy encourages transit-oriented development. The plan recommends the creation of a new land use designation, mixed use TOD, and proposes transit-oriented development at the 55th and Arapaho um, station area as described in the station area plan. To preserve service commercial uses, the plan applies community industrial land uses to key areas of East Boulder preserves over 500 acres for industrial uses and includes recommendations for a business retention program to help manage potential displacement from redevelopment projects. Um, this, the policy recommends converting commercial and industrial uses to residential, and we've already um, demonstrated some of the impacts that we anticipate on our local housing stock. The plan also incorporates regional um, transportation improvements to the network of mobility choices, regional and local transportation improvements to the network of mobility choices, and identifies infrastructure to support the use of BRT, biking, walking, and other micro mobility options. 
And then finally, the, the policy describes the need to mitigate the impacts of traffic congestion. The plan does this in a couple of ways. At the station area, there's a recommendation for a general improvement district to help manage parking, transit access, as well as new connections and system enhancements that will help distribute congestion. But another important piece of traffic impacts that we consider is how trips in the area affect our GHG emissions. Our transportation staff estimates that the planned transportation and connections plan could, excuse me, <laughs> that the planned um, land use and connections plans could result in a 28.3% per capita reduction in GHG emissions from trip generation. The increase in residential population in the plan drives the GHG reduction since residential vehicle trips are significantly shorter than employee trips especially um, non-resident employees. So according to our um, resident travel diary and the Boulder Valley employee surveys, residents on average travel approximately 12 miles per day in vehicles for all, all of their trips throughout the day. Um, whereas our non-resident employees average 28 vehicle miles per day for their work trips alone. So this could really be um, a great outcome. Okay, um, so I hope that information was helpful to understanding some of the potential impacts of the plan. Right now, we're in the middle of an engagement window. Our community questionnaire on Be Heard Boulder will be open through April 4. And then on the 12th, we will go to city council to share feedback from boards and the community and collect their recommendations for any final changes to the plan. And then we'll go back um, make final edits and, and really try and, and complete these plans. So there's a joint public hearing with planning board and council scheduled for May 3. And then we'll be looking for planning board's approval, hopefully on the plan on May 5th. So that's what's coming up. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Jean Gatza to introduce our amazing working group members who are here to speak to you tonight. Very good. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm I know I'm really excited and um, our whole team is excited. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I have a question about something that Kathleen talked through and left out a big thing. And I don't want us to go to the members of the working group until she's had a chance to answer the question, which has to, I'm sorry, but um, the jobs question, you completely left out the Flatirons Park and uh, I think that you've left us with incomplete information. So if you could please talk us through that and then we can go to the working group members, that would be awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so the, our concept for redevelopment in that Flatirons Park area, we really focused the um, new spaces, the redeveloped spaces along the 55th Street corridor and that's really just a couple of parcels. And so those job numbers are low because that's, that's what we really focused on. We did not um, propose any new or significant um, industrial or office changes within the park itself. But I think based on what we've seen recently, we could um, you know, based on some of the recent trends in how that area has been developing, we can take another look at what, what to expect, but in our concept, that's what's included. So if I can just follow up the, um, you said to us on our tour on Tuesday that what the opportunity that exists in the Flatirons area is the existing uh, zoning, which has not been fully um, built out. So for example, the building that we drove by that um, is the all glass four-story building that we approved like a year ago. I, I can't remember, I think it's on the, I can't remember what, what road it's on. So that went from being a two-story light industrial building is gonna be an office building. So is that what you are referring to in terms of the trends? Yes. Okay, and so 
um, it would be very helpful since we're being asked to talk about um, how what the what the development of this uh, large area might mean for the jobs housing imbalance to get a calculation about what it would mean if the Flatirons area is fully developed to the existing maximum. Uh, yeah, to the exist. That would be very, very helpful. Okay. Thank you. I don't have that tonight, but we can um, do it in a follow-up. John, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, as uh, someone who participated in a lot of the meetings, I, I have a pretty good sense of how things went. But I think, uh, Kathleen, there were a couple things that you might want to discuss at this point. One were the assumptions of the types of housing that you, uh, which assumptions you made uh, to come up with the total numbers of uh, residential units that you mentioned earlier in your presentation. And here I'm, I'm talking about, for example, you know, missing middle or garden level type uh, duplexes or stack flats or, or those sorts of a description of those sorts of uh, assumptions that you've made. I'm, I'm definitely happy to talk through that, but I know that we have um, working group members with time limitations and I wanna make sure that they get a chance to speak. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm happy to come back to that. That'll be fine. Good point to raise, John. Great, okay. Um, as I was mentioning, and I think, um, as Kathleen mentioned when we started, so excited to have a few of the working group members who have volunteered to share some of their thoughts um, about that experience and the outcomes with the board. Um, as you likely read in the materials and we've talked about over the last couple of years, the working group members have been so highly involved, in, especially in the discussions of the land use map. Coming back from the engagement on the 60% draft, the group reviewed the feedback that we got from the community and really helped us um, take another look, reassess, and land on the land use map that's in the draft plan. We Certainly appreciate having John Gerstel serve as the planning board liaison to the working group. He can provide a testament to the dedication of this group and the work that and their hard work. John invested a lot of time um, participating and sharing insights from that planning board lens. So um, just want to acknowledge that effort. The feedback that we received and that you saw in your materials um represents really a range of viewpoints in the community about the different topics of concern and the level of support for the vision moving forward within our working group that's not different um, our working group worked very hard to deeply explore the range of choices and um, the outcomes for the vision for east boulder they um some of those views are were included also in your materials in the appendix c so first i would like to um introduce anna karina casas Severa and leticia garcia um, who have been serving as um, our community connectors on the working group this was a really special opportunity based on the relationship with El, El Centro Amistad, and that these two ladies were leaders in their own communities by being um, promotoras de salud, so um, health promoters. Um, I'm not sure exactly what their best word is, um, and trusted in their communities. And even more special because um, Leti is a resident at the San Lazaro Mobile Home Park neighborhood and um, so well connected with her neighbors there. I um, Their role was really special on the working group, not only serving as members, 
but also hand in hand with us designing and executing the community engagement with San Lazaro residents and also other um, Spanish speakers in Boulder. Typically, when we come back, come to the board with these types of projects, we will have summarized feedback for you, but I'm so pleased that they're here to provide some insight to you directly because you don't get to usually hear from the Spanish speaking community or our typically underrepresented groups. I also just wanna say that this level of meaningful engagement with the Spanish speaking community, I mean, we, I think we still have a long way to go, but we would not have been able to achieve this without the work of Anna and Letty helping us design and execute um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one engagement with folks. And I also wanna just mention that having our language, new language access manager, Manuela Cifuentes, that this is, this is a big step forward for us and in, an investment in this type of engagement. And they'll speak to that a little bit, but I, I can't help myself, but um, uh, to say thank you to them and to um, be excited that they can have been so involved in this project and then be able to speak directly to this board. Following Anna and Letty will be uh, Aaron Bagnell, Peter Aweda, and Laura Kaplan, our other working group members. But um, at this point, I would like to uh, hand it over to Anna. Hello. Hola a todos. Um, okay. Well, first, I want to start, start by acknowledging that we live, we work, and we study in the territories of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, Navajo, Comanche, Lakota, and other peoples who have, who although we do not name, have called these lands their home and recognize that they were violently dispossessed that is necessary to make amends. My name is Ana Karina Casas Ibarra. My mother crossed the border with my two younger brothers and I in 1999. We arrived in Boulder on a snowy April 24th. I went to Casey Middle School and I graduated from Boulder High School. I got married here and I am raising my two sons here. And even though I love Boulder and consider this town my home, I grew up in Boulder living in fear watching my community live in fear. Police have always profiled people, but before SB 90 got repealed in 2012, police could act as immigration agents. Police pull, um, pulled people over any little excuse um, just because they looked a certain way. My husband used to get pulled over like a lot, so many times. One of those times it was because he had dirty license plates. Um, many people got arrested and taken to jail from which ICE would pick them up. Victims, victims of domestic violence were taken to jail because they could not prove their legal status and reported to ICE. Many families got separated and torn apart. These created a lot of um, distrust in the community. My community has been told time and time again that they do not belong in this city. Once while having a conversation with my aunt who used to live in Boulder, who owns her own cleaning business and has several clients in Boulder. She told me that Boulder makes it, makes it so people like us would never be able to afford to buy a home here. She said, they want us to work for them, to clean for them and make their food but they don't like us living here. Throughout these years, I have seen my friends, families, my aunts, my uncles move away because life in Boulder was too expensive or because they wanted to build um, equity and buy a home. But that was impossible here in Boulder. So why do I tell you all of this? Because all of these 
um, are factors. And these factors come into play when trying to do community engagement for the city. And it's hard. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of resources. We face so many barriers, and there are so many barriers that prevent people from participating. The, communi the community feels distrust. We have been told again and again that we don't belong. And simply, our communities are working hard to survive. We cannot expect peop people to just suddenly come out and be excited about participating in this process when we do not even know this process existed to give their opinion on how certain buildings or homes will look like when they may not even set foot inside these places. So how do we get people to care? Um, as Jean mentioned, I work for Centro Amistad and I have been working in the community for many years. El Centro Amistad is a nonprofit organization that has been working in the Spanish speaking community since 2001. It was funded by Latino leaders in Boulder and is currently directed and staffed by Latinos. Um, our promotoras de salud have been working in the community since 2016, creating trust and relationships with our community. Leti and I were brought on from Amistad to work as community connectors for the East Boulder Subcommunity Project. The relationships and the Networks we formed in the community through promotoras uh, were key in our work for this project because it was how we worked doing the surveys and focus groups. Um, we had to have conversations with people one-on-one, -on -one, explain why it was important to participate, what was at stake here. Um, when we um, got conf confronted uh, with people saying things like, the city does not care about us, why bother if they never take into consideration what we say anyways? So we had to tell them, so we have to try. We have to keep trying and maybe this time it will be different. So we had to go to people's homes to deliver translated paper surveys. We help people understand the complex concepts of being um, that were being presented. Uh, one survey could take us up to an hour to complete with people. Sometimes it was 10 p.m. when we were picking up surveys from people's homes because it was the, the time that they were available. When inviting people to focus groups, we had to make individual calls to invite them and explain to them what it was about and why, why it was important to participate. Um, then again, calls and texts to remind them about the meetings or the surveys. And during COVID, when we had to go virtual, we had to go to people's homes to help them download and explain how Zoom worked so they could participate. We are part of the community. We know our community. We have the connections. We know the necessities, the barriers, the challenges. And we know how resilient our community is. And even with all of this, the community engagement for this project was hard. <sighs> Through all of this, it was key that the planning staff like Dean and Kathleen were so supportive and that they really showed us that they care. They always did everything they could to have interpretation and materials translated. Um, but most importantly, they showed that they, they care about the opinion of our community, that they were not just doing this to mark a a checkbox. So thank you for that. Um, we may not have had hundreds of people in our focus groups, but the engagement we were able to accomplish was extremely meaningful because people are learning about the importance of community engagement. And with the recommendations of this plan, we may see the results of it. And uh, this time it may be different from other times where they have asked our opinion. Um, during the engagement, we saw that the general, um, that in general, general um, people were less interested in topics like land use or the character of a building, how a building should look. But people um, are more interested in the direct impact to their neighbor neighborhood, 
and things that directly affect our lives. Um, so things like the annexation of San Lazaro, the dire need for more op opportunities for affordable housing, the need for ownership programs for people to build wealth. Um, because traditionally people of color have had fewer opportunities to establish credit, credit or home equity through family, um, familiar avenues. So opportunities for jobs or affordable business space and affordable public transportation nearby. So I ask you today to please prioritize the annexation of San Lazaro and the rent stabilization of such. Um, the hub extensions to East Boulder and the recommendations for affordable public transportation. Um, programs that offer cultural and Spanish language programming at the Balmont City Park to hire art, artists of color to create culturally relevant art, expand the community benefits program in a responsible way to create more affordable housing, um, update the community benefit programs that could potentially create affor affordable commercial space and prioritize minority groups who have traditionally been left out of such programs. Also, the incubator space at the city uh, own sites um, as affordable commercial space and also prioritizing community and minority groups. Um, I also wanted to take this time to say thank you to Ryan for inviting us to work with the East Boulder Working Group. Um, we have learned so much and we have taken so much back to our community. And even though Letty and I were getting paid to do this work because we would have not been able to deal without it. So we're not here for personal gain. We're here because we care about the collective well-being of our community. And programs like Community Connectors and the collaborations with organizations that know the community are, fun fundament are fundamental for increasing community engagement and advancing equity in Boulder. So, one way or another, people of color have always been pushed out of Boulder and systematic racism and oppression has always been a play in Boulder, always. It is time to make significant change to policies and to maintain and create programs that advance racial equity. The East Boulder of Community Plan is a great opportunity for Boulder to create significant change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Leti Garcia. Leti? Sí, gracias. Mi nombre es Leticia Garcia. He vivido aquí en Bolde por 22 años. Uh, llegué a vivir aquí en San Lázaro hace cuatro años. Lo primero que me di cuenta fue que no teníamos agua potable. El agua de la llave no se puede consumir para comer, incluso ni para bañarse. El tener que comprar botellas de agua contribuye muchísimo al, al calentamiento global también. Me di cuenta que no teníamos acceso a los programas de, que usualmente están disponibles para los residentes de Boulder. Por ejemplo, la asistencia financiera para los rec centers y las clases y programas que el Departamento de Parques y Recreaciones tienen para los niños y los jóvenes. Y ya no pude inscribir yo a mis hijas cuando llegué aquí a San Lázaro porque ahí me di cuenta de que ya no pertenecía a, a la ciudad de Boulder. Por estas y otras razones, mi participación en el grupo de trabajo del proyecto de Ace de Boulder ha sido una de mis, de mis prioridades estos últimos dos años, ya que pertenezco a esta comunidad y yo y mi familia estamos viviendo las dificultades diariamente. Este proyecto afecta directamente a los residentes de San Lázaro mi comunidad y mi familia. Claro que al principio yo no sabía el gran impacto que este proyecto podía tener en mi comunidad. Yo llegué al grupo de trabajo de, de, de Boulder cuando nos contrataron por el programa de promotores de salud del Centro de Amistad, como ya lo mencionó Ana, para hacer conectores comunitarios y para este proyecto y hacer enlaces comunitarios también. Al principio no entendía nada y no entendía cuál era mi lugar en este, en este proyecto. Estábamos con gente preparada y que sabía 
al derecho y al revés estos temas. No conocemos el vocabulario, en realidad no nos sentíamos que, éramos, que pertene pertenecíamos a esto. Y, y nos sentíamos perdidas al principio, pero poco a poco nos dimos cuenta cuánto este proyecto afectaría la comunidad de San Lázaro, ya que es la zona eh, de residencia en el sur comunidad de Isdebolde, es la única zona que, está, que estaría afectada. Al compartir la información del proyecto con mi comunidad, me di cuenta que muchos compartiríamos la misma, los mismos miedos. El desarrollo de las zonas alrededor de San Lázaro pondrían en peligro nuestro hogar. Entonces empecé a animar a mis vecinos a que participaran en las encuestas y en los grupos de enfoque para que conocieran nuestras opiniones y necesidades. Durante este proceso y la participación de la comunidad en, la, en las encuestas y los grupos de enfoque, escuchamos que primordialmente hay, una, hay un gran miedo que San Lázaro desaparezca a consecuencia de este proyecto. Otro es que la renta aumente desproporcionadamente para nosotros también. Hay un gran deseo y necesidad de que los residentes de San Lázaro sean anexados a la ciudad de Boulder por dos razones. Tener acceso al agua potable y tener acceso a los diferentes programas y servicios que ofrece la ciudad de Boulder. Estamos en un país de tercer mundo y es a veces injusto que uno no tenga lo primordial que es el agua. Entonces yo les quiero pedir a ustedes de la Junta de Planificación que pongan como prioridad las recomendaciones que el plan que sería anexar a San Lázaro, el programa para la estabilización de las rentas de, del parque, que a cambio de que la ciudad proporcione las extensiones a servicios de agua y alcantarillados. Es la primera vez que participo en, este, en estas clases de proyectos. He aprendido muchísimo y estoy muy agradecida de haber tenido esta oportunidad. Las cosas que fueron fundamentalmente importantes para que nosotras pudiéramos participar en este proyecto y hacer el enlace comunitario fueron tener a Brian y a Jean en este espacio apoyándonos y dándonos la confianza, ellos nos hicieron sentir que estábamos ahí para que, por una sola razón, que nuestras voces fueran, eran importantes y que fueran escuchadas. Tener intérprete desde el primer día, yo especialmente, porque yo no soy totalmente bilingüe. Y no simplemente cualquier intérprete, sino alguien que es parte de la comunidad y que me acompañó todo, en todo este proyecto desde hace dos años. Ella es Ángela. Ella... Su voz, yo ya, es mi voz para ustedes. Yo la llamo mi voz angelical porque a través de ella yo transmito mis necesidades mías y de mi comunidad. El haber tenido todo el material traducido para llevar a nuestra comunidad, eso quita la barrera de acceso lingüístico. Dar a conocer el proceso que se lleva a la planificación del proyecto de la ciudad, ir acostumbrando a la gente que su voz es importante y que está siendo escuchada, aunque sean en pequeños pasos, pero ahí vamos. Yo sé que este proyecto nos va a llevar, eh, va, vamos, a tener, vamos a ver los resultados, no a corto plazo, pero tra el trabajo se está haciendo para las próximas generaciones que vienen, en especialmente para mi comunidad. El incluir gente como yo, una mujer inmigrante, hispanohablante, madre, trabajadora independiente, este tipo de proyectos es necesario para avanzar en la queda de Boulder. Muchas gracias por su tiempo y ser parte de que hoy fueron, hoy mi voz fue escuchada. En verdad, se los agradezco. Gracias. Thank you, Leti. Ana and Leti really brought um, so much of the voices of their community uh, repeatedly throughout this process. And um, I, I, I'm sure the other working group members can speak to this, but um, from the staff perspective, it was, it was just so good for us to constantly be reminded of the concerns and issues um, of that community. So thank you, Anna and Leti. Next up, um, we have three more working group members, Aaron Bagnell, Peter Oeda, and Laura Kaplan to share a few thoughts. Erin, I think you're up. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to Anna and Letty. That was really touching to hear. And um, 
I, I think it was really beneficial, as Jean said, to to serve with you both on that working group. And I want to say that I hope that this isn't the last one that you serve on and that maybe even go for planning board one day because you could be in this room too. And it would be fantastic to continue what you've already started to do. And I appreciate Jean and Ryan both for facilitating, facilitating that at the city. Um, okay. so. It, it, the whole the whole working group process was great as you as you've heard from lots of us tonight it was a special working group and we had a lot I've had a lot of pleasure working with everybody um and every one of the Boulder city of Boulder employees that has graced us with their presence um I feel really lucky to have been able to participate in it and I think this is an absolutely amazing opportunity for the city of Boulder and for the future of East Boulder in particular. Um, my main message for you tonight is balance because I want you to know that what you're seeing in front of you with this packet is the result of a lot of different conversations and a lot of differing views. Um, as I'm sure you all know on this board, there are people that would prefer Boulder remain the exact same with no parking reductions, no change in traffic, and no buildings over 35 feet. And then there are people on the other side of the spectrum that would like to get rid of the height limit and limit zoning restrictions and not have people have cars. So, you know, planning for the future of Boulder, we have to entertain a lot of differing opinions. So, um, density conversations are not always easy. Change is never easy. The human nature has a bias towards the status quo. Um, the reason I bring this up is because all of the areas of change that you see in the plan, and I'm going to ask if Kathleen doesn't mind just opening up that graphic because I'm going to reference the areas of change within our um, East Boulder area plan boundary. And I, I think it's important to look at this as a graphic because um, we, as a working group, the main, the goal of the plan is to increase areas of walkable, diversified neighborhoods um, and in the communities where it is most appropriate. So if you look at this graphic, East Boulder is a lot of, there's a lot of red line and the areas of change were strate strategically chosen. Um, because we also wanted to, as, as Kathleen has shown you, uh, preserve areas of affordable industrial where it was most appropriate. And, and I think you'll see tonight, and if you've read through this whole uh, document, that that's, that's what we're, we've, we've accomplished. Um, so in, in planning for the future, there are strategic densification um, opportunities here. So we have the Valmont Park West, we'll start there. Um, it has an established neighborhood to the north. It has a city park to the east. It has a multi-use greenway connection to the south and a major transit corridor on the west. So allowing for um, middle density development of homes here, it's a great complement to the, the neighborhood to the north. It allows for that neighborhood to the north to to kind of grow into the south and grow into the park and take advantage of opportunities that they wouldn't have there um, otherwise. And it also creates opportunities for people to live in that area and enjoy the park. So um, that's why that spot was chosen um, or one of the reasons. Uh, the same is true for the Valmont Park East area. It has the established neighborhood to the Northeast, San Lazaro although um, not in city limits right now, I do support the prioritization of the annexation as well. Um, so it has a city park to the west, the multi-use greenway to the south, and it's at the elbow of three transit corridors. So again, allowing for mid-density development here creates opportunities for people to live in Boulder and it adds community benefits to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, Flatirons Business Park is a great opportunity to provide um, this area with existing business and office area that's already starting to kind of emerge into a funky personality. 
Um, it has the bike path to the east. It has, it's at the east and the north, and it's bound by 55th, a transit corridor on the west. Um, this area of change provides an opportunity for, to allow for um, more of what Boulder needs, transit connection improvements, housing and community innovation hubs. And lastly, the 55th area, Arapaho Station area, which we colloquially refer to as STAMP. Um, the transit oriented development part of this area plan is quite appropriately positioned at this intersection of a major transit corridor with um, major future goals to connect the city of Boulder to all of our communities to the east. So um, I think everyone can agree or most people can agree that when you think of an appropriate area for smart growth and smart density and high density and height, it makes the most sense along these major transit corridors. So the stamp area in particular presents great opportunities to allow for East Boulder to have an identity and a community hub. Um, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing everybody's feedback. Uh, and I encourage you to support staff's exp expertise throughout this process. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Peter, I think you're up. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate being able to, to talk here for just a couple minutes. I'll make my uh, comments pretty brief. Um, first of all, huge thanks to the staff for their work. This was a, a huge project and they stayed on course through uh, pandemic and uh, three years when it was, I think it was originally supposed to be a one year project, but we all saw the uh, value of staying on. So it's been a great uh, process, I think. Um, this was really, uh, as been said before, a collaborative uh, effort uh, to, with the whole East Boulder community coming together to create this vision. Um, it's really been the greatest example of civic discourse that I've ever seen in Boulder. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. Uh, we got to visit businesses, the airport, art studios, uh, parks, and, uh, and businesses in the area. Um, it, you know, it wasn't a fast track change or midnight moratorium. There, there weren't late night council meetings with pitchfork mobs. It was a very civil, deliberate, educational and thoughtful process that's still ongoing. Um, and the result is better after getting input from employers, employees, uh, residents, property owners, architects, city planners, and other stakeholders. And I hope, I hope that this is a model for future sub-community planning and other uh, city of Boulder projects. Um, the, the process here, I think, will be measured in decades, not, not really years. Uh, if the city council ultimately approves the working group's recommendations, this neighborhood will not be transformed overnight. Uh, but it wasn't about really changing the neighborhood overnight. It was about Boulder adapting as a city to the residential, commercial, climate, and transportation needs for the next 20 years and beyond. Uh, our vision for new housing in East Boulder, uh, whether market rate or affordable, is not traditional single-family detached housing, but rather more dense, centered around transportation with the ability to walk to retail, amenities, arts, entertainment, and work. Uh, COVID has changed obviously a lot of the uh, uses of commercial space and we're not really sure how that's gonna end up. That'll just be kind of an ongoing experiment, I think. Uh, I think flexibility with some of the zoning codes will give projects a, a better chance of success here and create a sense of community, culture, and vibrancy that it, in East Boulder that's not there today. Uh, residential and industrial uses don't always mix. And uh, there was a good discussion about phasing in changes to certain areas. So manufacturing with higher emissions doesn't, isn't next to a residential area. And uh, putting buffers in between certain types of uses so that uh, you know either retail or light industrial uses could be between those but they can all be within the same walkable neighborhood. 
Uh, transportation is obviously a huge part of this plan. Uh, since we're trying to capture a lot of in commuters uh, that drive into and out of Boulder every day, the connections are a really important part of it. And as Gene Sanson mentioned earlier, the East Arapahoe Transit Plan uh, offers a lot better connectivity from East Boulder to the rest of the town and within itself. Um, a mobility hub is planned for East Boulder to facilitate getting in and out of the area. And uh, we can't wait for the gondola station in East Boulder to be a part of the, uh, the Boulder gondola network. We're really excited for that. Uh, in summary, I just wanna say East Boulder is such a great opportunity to transform aging infrastructure uh, into a modern mixed use neighborhood to further Boulder's housing, climate and transportation goals. Thanks, Peter. And Thanks. then lastly, I'm ha so happy to introduce Laura Kaplan, who's um, been a working group member, very active with the group over the last few years and who will be your new um, colleague on the planning board um, and to be able to carry the work uh, from East Boulder forward as a board member. So Laura, I think you have last uh, last comments and, and a wrap up, thank you. Well, thank you, um, Jean, and uh, I will try to be brief. I wanna start out by uh, noting that Peter was joking about the gondola station. So if anybody <laughs> was not aware that that was a joke no gondola station planned. Um, so uh, like everybody else, I really want to thank the staff for the tremendous lift that they did here. Um, and I want to thank all of my fellow members on the working group. Um, we, we all had diverse opinions. We came from diverse backgrounds and we brought a lot of heart and, and thought and brain power and experience um, and uh, life experience to this group. So I think it was, um, a very well-rounded group with a lot of really great discussions. I think Aaron and Peter have really covered very well the substance as well as Kathleen, of course, in her presentation. So I, I mostly wanna focus on talking about the process of the working group because I'm a facilitator um, and I wanna echo the, and so it was interesting for me to participate as a participant and kind of not have to arrange anything, but just observe the artwork of the city of Boulder and how they do a, a, a community, a sub-community plan including a great deal of outreach um, and trying to include the diversity of opinions in all of Boulder. So I wanna emphasize that this working group, we didn't vote on anything. So, so if people think that this was like a majority and they're counting the different members and trying to see who had more members on the group, we were not a voting group. We were very much a collaborative discussion oriented group where people could raise any issue um, and the pros, the cons, the interests associated with it. Um, and, and really explore. And what happened in this subcommunity planning process, I think was a surprise to a lot of people. It was not a fait accompli. You know, we, we looked at concepts ranging from areas of high density and medium density residential only. We looked at keeping uh, industrial areas very industrial. And we really sort of settled on, you know, what best meets the interests of the community and the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan and that intention to have um, more housing, more residential, but still maintain our commercial and industrial spaces. And we had settled on a concept of this mixed use industrial being the most appropriate classification for most of the areas of change. And some of that high density, or not high density, but that transit oriented development around the stamp area. And that's what you're gonna see in this subcommunity plan is the ground floor is almost always maintaining that commercial and industrial use. And almost always the residential is built on top of that. And that's part of why it takes the form that it does. You know, it's not, we're not looking at a whole lot of townhouses with yards. We're looking at more uh, condos that might be above a commercial or industrial space. Um, and that is done very intentionally so that you can have those walkable neighborhoods. You can have people who love the grittiness, love the industry, love the commercial uses, love the artwork and the arts community that can be sustained in East Boulder and still have that personality and have people living there and provide homes for people. And 25% of those homes approximately will be that um, more affordable inclusionary housing. So, you know, we all had different opinions on the group and tried to push pull the plan in different directions, myself included. But I guess what I wanna emphasize is that we really have landed on what we think is, um, you know, we support staff in going in this direction of trying to incorporate 
the main interests as best they could on a limited landscape. Um, and I think this community is going to be so fun and so funky and so um, that the transit's going to be amazing. The job opportunities are still going to be there as well as um, adding housing that Boulder so desperately needs. So again, I really want to commend staff for doing the impossible job of trying to uh, listen to all of these voices, honor where everybody's coming from, and find a map that can really uh, push in the direction that the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan wants us to go um, and meet the community needs. So, and again, I, I, I want to stop on the note of 100% support for prioritizing the annexation of San Lazaro. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura, Aaron, Peter, Anna, Letty, and the board, mem board members for indulging us for a longer presentation than usual tonight. But it, we just felt it was so important for you to hear directly um, from some of the working group members. With that, um, Kathleen, I can turn it back to you or to Peter. I don't know if we want a short break before we jump into what I'm sure will be um, lots of questions. That may be a good idea. We're going to have clarifying questions and then board discussion. Is that correct? And a, and a public hearing. Public hearing. Public hearing, of course. Um, what would be next? First up would be um, questions. How does the board feel about a five minute break? All right, I see some thumbs. Five minute break, we'll be back at 735. Great. And Jean, um, I uh, and Cindy, I uh, did have a little bit of a router reboot issue. So I'm going to try to switch back to another hotspot that is more stable. Uh, so you'll probably have to let me back in in a minute. Thank you. I will watch for you. Yeah, I, I haven't had this hotspot go out, but it went out for a couple minutes. So, all right. Okay. I'll keep my eyes open. Thanks. Okay.
All right. And I just want to remind our board members when you are asking questions to speak slowly so our interpreters can keep up, please. Just a gentle reminder. Let's also take care to keep our comments in this section to actual questions and not veer into deliberation so that we leave plenty of time for uh, public before we get to our part. I see a hand from JG, JG Money. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, repeat the question I asked earlier, but we didn't have time to respond. And that was uh, to learn what sorts of assumptions were being made with respect to the nature of the housing uh, in the estimates that were produced for the for this plan. Yeah, I can pull up our um, table that shows what that mix is. So are you seeing a spreadsheet? Yes, okay, great. So this is um, what the, the development concept that we put into our model, these are the types of units that are included. So, you know, consistent with the mobile home units in San Lazaro, and then um, the EBSP row, is what we're looking at for what's included in the subcommunity plan. So it's about a thousand studio sized, 3,500 ish mid sized apartments, 99 um, large apartments, um, 148 townhomes, and then 72 live work units. And then I'm actually going to ask. Um, Kalani, who's the city's urban designer, to talk about what the assumptions for these unit sizes are, because um, you know what we've built into, say, a mid-size apartment is, in in my living experience, uh, pretty large. So I'll, I'll stop sharing. And I'll ask Kalani to talk about those. Oh, you're on mute, Kalani. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. So um, we have a range of units. John, the um, right now the mix was assumed at about 70% uh, mid-size apartments. And that is the from the 2019 apartment, the flat, what the census has for the average is about a thousand square feet. So we use that number as kind of the broad brush number for the um, mid-size apartments. We did anticipate that there's probably a need for some larger family-sized apartments at about 1,500 square feet. And then the townhouse units also from the average size in the census from 2019, because we took these numbers before the most recent census came out, is about 2,200 square feet. And that also is the live work size because that include, it was counted as a, single family attached style living with a work unit embedded into it. And then the small studios or the efficiencies are roughly 350 square feet. So those are the sizes and the kind of um, typologies for those, for those residential units. But the, the spread or the mix is, is roughly, I'd say, um, looking at the numbers, you're looking at primarily flat style ranging from mid-size to, um, uh, or I'm sorry, efficiencies to large apartments. And that's about, I'd say 85%, 90% of the residential units in the area. Well, thank you. Uh, can I just follow up uh, with a quick question? Um, 
that is uh, is is that distribution based on staff's assessment of what is most needed, or or how did that uh, distribution come about? Yeah, so we used um, the performance standards in the place types, and then modeled out one concept of many that could be out there for how those place types might um, play out in in real space on the real parcels. So that's part of the modeling work that we did. So I, I understand that you made that assumption and, and distribution, but, but was there some explicit consideration of what is most needed in Boulder? On a citywide level, is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we talked about throughout the process of this plan is trying to provide and create living spaces that would be suitable for people that work in the area. And so we did, you know, consider the demographics of people that we know um, come to this area uh, in general. And that mix, I think, is, is representative of the workforce. But it it doesn't, um, I wouldn't say that we identified citywide um, what are the, the, the different, you know, I think our understanding of housing needs is we need more of all different kinds of housing throughout the city. And so part of what the types of housing that we created or that we're thinking about for this area are intended to really be context sensitive to the existing conditions and are meant to be integrated with um, some of the businesses and, and um, different types of uses in these neighborhoods as well. Thank you. Uh, David, I see you have a hand up. Do you have a clarifying question? I have a question on a different topic. But um, <clears throat> if you want to finish that topic first, but uh, if you can, can I ask just one more clarifying question on that topic before we go ahead, George. Thanks. Um, th that mix, uh, I understand sort of the ELU rules in the city. So is this the mix that Boulder gets? Or is it possible for someone to double the number of ELUs? for some of the mid-size or other types of units that are being proposed here? How does that work? I'll have Kalani respond, yeah. So are you talking about the, um, the, the two for one count in the zoning for the ELUs? Yes. No, this is just straight numbers on ELUs in here. We, that's a, um, that factor is a little bit different when you're actually looking at development review um, projects that come through. So when we say that there's um, a proposed thousand ELU, they we're counting each one here, not counting half of them because it's a the two for one count in the zone. Oh no, I don't mean I don't mean the ELUs and the the small studios. I mean the the um, units that could be split into ELUs. Split into I don't so, know if I quite understand. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get the clarification myself. So, so this mix that's being proposed yeah. is the mix that would actually be developed. Or no, I I think that that's one of the things that um this could flex around quite a bit. It would also depend on some zoning when the zoning changes come later. What you want, where, what type of housing within, say the um the park west area versus the park east area. And you start to get into, hey, we want flats versus townhomes versus more efficiencies over in workforce housing. So there'll be more of that at, at a later time, but um, this is a generalized mix. We tend to see more flats in this type of development pattern, especially with TODs. Um, and so I would anticipate that this could, um, be more or less depending on you have more ELUs versus more large family style flats. 
So that's where I think um, in the next phase of the work, when you really dig into the zoning code and what's the kind of housing typology you want to see where it really starts to get pretty important at that point. But this is flexible. I, I think that the mix will change. And it also changes a bit on with the developer and the market, what they're going to put in. All right. So, so if I was clarifying this in my own head and for the community, this is a snapshot of what could happen. But there's a lot of nuance that could happen going forward. And we don't really understand what that range of nuance is yet. Yeah, and I, for example, I think if you took a small parcel in um, in one area and um, say you wanted more family flats there and less workforce housing, less 350 square foot units, I think it's important at the time when you get to the zoning regulations to really go, okay, this is the area we want to focus on family flats. You know, that's the housing type you want to allow there, or you want a higher percentage of that. And so that... Um, it, that is a step in this process as you start to get into more definition after this plan is adopted. Yes. Thank you for that. David, I think the floor is yours to take us to a different topic for now. After All right. Um, yeah, um, without getting into deliberation, um, and I, because I think that maybe Anna and Letty may not be able to, to both stay on for the rest of, for the entire meeting. I just want to acknowledge how powerful I felt uh, their presentations were uh, in terms of enlightening us to how the dominant culture can, can kind of uh, create barriers uh, to everybody's involvement. And I, 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 I think that it was incredibly uh, an incredible advancement for the city of Boulder to bring in the connector program into this uh, area plan subcommittee planning process for the first time. So Kathleen, my question is, will we take <clears throat> the learnings from this uh, to further uh, develop our uh, the ways that we do things to try to be more inclusive in general? Uh, is, is there kind of a, a a takeaway from this that's part of uh, part of the, uh, um, the the path going forward um, for community outreach and being more inclusive. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, um, you know, this plan kicked off um, pretty soon after the adoption of our um, engagement strategic framework, and we identified the project as sort of a pilot for this collaborative approach, um, which, you know, the promise of a collaborative engagement project is that you really partner with the community and um, they're involved in the decision-making. And so having that community connector um, program was just a, a key step in being able to deliver on that kind of a promise. And we learned so much about it. Um, just, just interpretation and translation of materials, understanding the timing of that and how far in advance we have to complete our work to be able to have material translated so that it can be used by Spanish speakers. Um, the cost, you know, when we put together our budgets and, and request funding for these types of projects, we have a totally new understanding of, of how much it really costs to do this level of engagement and um, you know, providing interpretation consistently, what, what that kind of impact would be on, on future planning processes. But I think um, everyone on our team has really felt the value of it. And we know that um, having that program and having Anna and Letty involved throughout the process directly impacted the recommendations that are included in the plan. And so um, I can't imagine doing another plan of this scale without having that, that type of um, program instilled throughout the engagement process because it was really, truly so valuable. 
Thanks, Kathleen. And uh, uh, I have had the uh, pleasure of working uh, with both Letty and, and Anna on other connector programs. And so um, they, they really thank you both again so much for, for your contribution to this. Indeed. That's incredible. Uh, Sarah, I see you have your hand up. Uh, thanks. I actually want to go back to the question that the, the, the topic of questions that John and George brought up. Mm -hmm. um, What's the pro? So one of the um, points made in the uh, report, the plan, uh, was the housing diversity, which is awesome. It's obviously something that a lot of us care deeply about. Um, what's a pr what's the process? What process can exist or does exist to ensure that there are actually ownership opportunities that are produced out of the whatever amount of and whatever wherever the location of the new housing will be? Um, that is a really challenging and complex issue. I'm going to ask Jay Sugnet to chime in um, on how that plays out. Good evening, everybody. So um, yeah, we had the same exact question at the Housing Advisory Board yesterday. Mm -hmm. I definitely understand we hear a lot from the community, the desire for more ownership units as opposed to rentals. Um, and unfortunately we don't have a, a lot of control over that. Um, it's really the market drives what type of product gets, gets delivered. Um, and the example I gave was, you know, back when we adopted the program in 2000 for inclusionary housing, you know, there was, uh, it was pretty much only ownership. And at that time, I remember reading memos from council saying, you know, we, we re we're really concerned that we're only getting ownership. We'd like to get more rental. And now the market has completely changed since the Great Recession. And so it is a bit change, uh, difficult for us to um, require one type of tenure. Um, but I think some progress is being made. Um, I think the development community in Boulder has heard loud and clear from planning board and city council, and they are uh, going to great lengths to try to provide more ownership products. But we don't have any tools to require it specifically. So I'm sorry, can I just follow up with that answer, Jay? Sure. So I know before, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name now, before Jacob left, there was a conversation happening in planning staff about uh, townhome opportunities because townhomes are fee simple, whereas condos are not. So, um, and I remember a conversation I had with a local developer when I first joined planning board who said, if you zone for townhomes, we'll build townhomes. So I do think we have some tools and I guess I mm -hmm. could, we, we may, they may not yet be implemented, <laughs> but I, I think we have some tools. So I, uh, I guess the question, is, and you have deed restriction op opportunities as well. So how do those potential tools get pulled into the next step in this process? I'll take a stab at that and I'll let others chime in. I mean, yeah, you're correct. I mean, so there are there's a particular zone that really was created to um, try to create townhomes in the city of Boulder. And I can't remember exactly which one it is, but that will be part of the whole rezoning discussion. But at this point, at the sort of very high comprehensive plan, subcommunity plan level, um, we don't, we're, we're, we're designating uh, land uses. We're not doing the zoning quite yet, but yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm, Okay, I, I realize that there's a gap between what we're talking about today and what will happen in the future, but because part of the discussion tonight is what are we, what are some of our recommendations to count mm -hmm. to you all and to council, I think thinking about the next step is pretty important to this process. So um, I realize that's not the total focus, but I'd like to encourage my colleagues to think about how what we talk about tonight leads to good decisions in the next step as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Sarah and Jay. Uh, do we have any more clarifying questions from the board before we move on to the next phase of the meeting? I see John's hand is up and George's hand's up. Let's go with you first, John, please. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I remember uh, from my participation in the in the meetings that uh, we've had to develop this plan that there has been a lot of discussion about mixed use and its potential particularly industrial residential mixed use and so i was wondering if there are any examples elsewhere either in boulder or in the in the metro area that you can point to that we could uh, take as uh, examples of how how it actually works uh, and uh, whether whether the folks in those areas are satisfied. Yeah, so the, the local example that we um, refer to a lot is the River North neighborhood of Denver. Um, and that I think, you know, certainly has a, a mixed use industrial type of land use and, and pattern. There are neighborhoods in, in River North that um, are probably have a lot greater density than what we're talking about for this area. Um, but there are certainly areas that, that um, are, are more comparable to, I think, what, what we're envisioning here. So no, no areas in Boulder that you can point to that are easy for us to take a look at uh, of, of that type? Um, I think, and I'm blanking right now on the name of the, of the neighborhood, but Jean Gatza, can you remind me, um, in Boulder Junction, there is a segment that's, um, mixed use industrial that has some live work type units. Um, and I'm not sure if North Boulder does, um, there is a steel particular yards or something? project. Steel yeah. yards. That's what I'm thinking of. Thank you. Um, so similar-ish, but not uh, not not quite what we're talking about. Okay. Well, thank you. That I, I think that'll be a key issue to put to get people comfortable with that designation is to see some examples where where it's worked out well. George, <clears throat> excuse me, Georgie. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I had a question. You had put up a slide, Kathleen, on um, per capita emissions and that they were going down as a result of this project. Um, I wanted to understand, um, get a little bit more sense of the calculation and mm -hmm. also understand what total emissions are um and not just per capita so what what what's projected yes. there so i do <laughs> um these calculations are are outside of my wheelhouse but our um excellent transportation staff chris haglin provided me with some of the talking points for this so i'm just going to uh refer to those um and then um gene sanson from transportation if i miss anything or misread anything, please correct me. Okay, so the trip generation and GHG analysis for the East Boulder subcommunity uses ITE trip generation rates for commercial and residential land uses. City of Boulder staff typically apply a 20% discount to ITT, ITE rates due to our history of multimodal investments and their impact on travel behavior. And so this reduction was applied in, in this case. Um, and then the uh, East Boulder subcommunity plan scenario also includes an additional 10% trip, re trip generation reduction to account for internal trip diversion and modal shifts due to changes in land use and additional multimodal improvements. Um, and then there's just a note that this was the same methodology used in the recent CU South trip budget analysis. So in the GHG analysis, the preferred scenario, so that's the subcommunity plan scenario, takes into account expected GHG 
reductions due to improvements in fuel efficiency and electrification at a conservative level. Um, so let's see. Um, so the per capita GHG emissions um, currently is estimated to be 3.7, I think it's million tons per person. And then under the trend scenario, um, which would be um, no change, um, but 20 years out, the per capita GHG emissions estimate reduces to 3.67. And then as I described preferred scenario, that lowers to 2.65. So I don't see in here the, the over, I don't have the overall emissions for these. We've just got the per capitas. But if that is information that um, you, would like to request, I can. Um, I, I think that would be that would be super helpful because it's being presented as as a big reduction, and so I'm just trying to get my head around the the math behind it, right? Because if if the same, I don't know whether or not the same methodology for CU South versus an existing industrial office area makes makes entire sense to me, but I, but, but it would you know, have to understand, you know, what the, what the variables are. And then yeah. I think it's beneficial for the community to not understand, not only understand on a per capita basis, but on an aggregate basis. Um, because at the end of the day, that's, you know, the, what we're breathing is not per capita, it's, it's aggregate. So I think that's helpful. Thank you. Sarah. Um, I actually have two questions and they're completely different. Uh, one, um, so Anna mentioned the need for affordable office space and business space and referenced back to trying to circle back around to the community benefits discussion that we had for the last year or so on that topic. Um, and I'm curious, what um, is there some location that uh, the working group and staff have been thinking about as a uh, location for some sort of affordable uh, area, or is the assumption that, and I, I'm just sort of curious what the thinking is about how to meet that particular need. Yeah, I think um, similar to the approach for affordable housing, affordable commercial space, can be um, can go anywhere and is appropriate anywhere, but to uh, initiate some of that and to kind of test out how a program might work, the places that we are looking at in the near term future are city owned land, city owned spaces. So in particular, um, there are there's no, um, a plan to expand the Municipal Services Center site. And so there's been conversations about um, creating um, potentially affordable commercial space in the redevelopment of that site. Um, and yeah, I think that I think that's the kind of near term one. Okay. Um, and then my other question, which totally other topic uh, in the proposal in the plan, there's a discussion or a mention of the need uh, to come up with some subsidies for developers uh, to incentivize, if that's a word, to incent um, development in the stamp, redevelopment in the stamp area. And I'm, I'm curious to understand uh, what is behind an assumption of a need to subsidized developers. Um, maybe I'm just not quite grasping what the, why we would need to do that. And um, once that's answered, what, um, what is the, what are the tools that are already being considered? Yes. Okay. So um, I think what you're referring to is there's a description of a need for incentives to 
in the stamp area for affordable housing in particular. And um, the reason for that is we had a market study done as part of the station area plan process. And the one of the key takeaways from that market study was that land within the stamp area is today performing great for owners. There is, you know, there the um, rents are well, things are leased out. There's not a reason for them to necessarily want to redevelop and to redevelop housing. So um, that incentive program or ideas about incentives are really around um, getting that mixed use redevelopment to happen and to get affordable housing uh, in particular. And then remind me about the second part of your question. No, it's, it's okay. Um, so just so you know, I actually wrote down here exactly what is in the report on page 65, and it doesn't actually reference specifically affordable housing. So when you go back through this with a fine tooth okay. comb, if that's actually the purpose of those incentive, in, incentive, what's the word? Incentives. Incentives, thank you. Um, you might want to clarify that because it makes it yeah. sound like it's just about incentivizing redevelopment. It doesn't specifically reference um, affordable housing. Okay, thank you. All right, unless uh, people feel that they have a clarifying question that cannot live inside uh, our uh, deliberation, I am going to suggest that we move on to the next phase of the meeting. Okay, hearing no objection. Peter, before you start, um, I just want to circle back. It looks like um, Lethe did have to leave. So at this point, we will let our interpreters um, be off for the evening. And I wanna thank everyone for bearing with us and definitely to um, Elena and Mara for their help in providing interpretation tonight. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the public hearing portion of this item. Um, if anyone from the public would like to speak to this item regarding the draft of the East Boulder subcommunity plan, please go down to the bottom and hover and click on raise hand. And we will, I see we're getting some folks raising their hands and we, and I will unmute you and I will put up a timer, giving you three minutes uh, for each person to speak. Remember that you will not have video, you will only have audio, um, but we will give each person three minutes to speak. And it looks like we are starting off with Rick. And if each person, I do see that we have several people here that ha only have first names or maybe even some initials. When you do begin to speak, if you would state your name, and where you live, you don't have to give your approximate address, but maybe a location that you live as well. And perhaps uh, if you're affiliated with anyone, uh, any group or anything um, associated with the East Boulder plan. Um, we're going to start with Rick. And Rick, you have been unmuted and you should be able to speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rick Johnson. I'm with uh, Johnson and Rapucci. And I did submit a letter um, to the planning board yesterday. Um, we, um, we represent Karen and Tom Benjamin, who are the owners of 5150 Valmont. And um, thanks to the staff and to the working group for their hard work on this plan, it's impressive. Um, the, uh, the Benjamins own um, Mountain Ocean, which has some iconic products. They've been in Boulder for like 50 years. Skin Trip Lotion, Lip Trip, Mother Special Blend um, are some of their products. Um, the city of Boulder has acquired the properties surrounding the Benjamin properties uh, for the Valmont Park, which is great. It's made their uh, property an outlier island really in the middle of the Valmont Park master plan. And uh, it was our hope that uh, with the changes discussed in the 
subcommunity plan that the land use might change on our property to something more residential and park friendly. And so um, it seemed we were a little disappointed um, with the 90% draft plan um, on the city website and in and, and our property's existing land use of community business remains unchanged. Well, everything around it is being changed. Um, and I think Aaron showed the map of the change areas with the cross hatching and literally everything around 5150 Belmont is cross hatched there. Um, it just seems like an, uh, an oversight and a missed opportunity. Um, the community business land use and then the underlying zoning that would um, be allowable wouldn't support a mix of residential and community retail opportunities that we think would be appropriate to this centralized location on Velma. So we'd like to suggest um, that a place type designation of Parkside Residential um, or even maybe Main Street Live and Work, but probably Parkside Residential would be um, very appropriate for this um, property. And it would create opportunities for both ground floor supported retail and residential uses, um, which I think Laura was talking about um, in her wrap up on the working group comments. Um, we are looking for more opportunities for people to live along that transit, transit corridor uh, and enjoy the greenway and open space. And um, I guess lastly, this property is um, in the opportunity zone. And the opportunity zone is supposed to be encouraging housing, including affordable housing. And uh, so we think um, this is a great opportunity on this property to kind of put our money where our mouth is. And um, it's a great opportunity for housing and community business on that site. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Rick, very much. And um, I may have missed it and you probably said it. What was your last name? I apologize if you said it. You bet, Rick Johnson. And Thank I'm you. with Johnson and Rapucci. Thank you so much, Rick. Our next speaker tonight is Mark McIntyre. Mark, I have unmuted you and you should be able to speak. Hi, thank you very much. Mark McIntyre, North Boulder. Um, as a newbie to uh, planning board, I, I wanna applaud the work of so many community and staff members. Uh, as someone that has participated in multiple working groups over many years, I know the amount of work that goes into these and the results cannot be underestimated. And I really thank all those that participated and spoke tonight. Um, I have chosen to focus on one thing that I know uh, just a little about, and that's parking. We live in a changing world and our behaviors and policies must change. Parking is one of those things that must change. Beginning on PDF page 20 in the plan, not the packet, parking is mentioned frequently in the place type section. It sounds like we are applying sump principles, which means shared, unbundled, managed and paid, that comes from our AMPS plan or access management plan. However, there's a missing word and that word is paid. Um, <clears throat> everywhere we refer to parking in this plan, paid seems to be missing. So people will accept paid parking if they have been told in advance that is paid, have an opportunity to change their behavior and their mode and have choices. Uh, you can't unbundle parking from residential or commercial space and not have it be paid. If you do, it will be overconsumed and you will create induced demand for additional driving. Um, so say the word paid and include it in there, I think we'll be better off. In the area change section on PDF page 15, Parking is a measured descriptor in every section, while square foot for mobility hubs and transportation options is not mentioned, i.e. transit stations, bike shares, scooter shares, truck shares, 
Um, I would suggest that we use the definition of mobility hubs on page 29 and give the square foot allowance for mobility hubs in all these areas. Um, finally, on page uh, 29, we show a cross section of an active street. This is a cross section for an active street for cars. You need to, I would suggest that we remove one or both park, parking on one or both sides of the street and, and add protected bike lanes. That will make this an active street. Um, so anyway, that's my input on this. I think what is an overall an excellent plan, but additional input on parking needs to be made. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, at this time, I don't see any other hands, so I'm going to give a last call for anyone else who would like to. Oh, we got another hand. Um, Lynn, I'm going to I'm going to unmute you here so you can speak. You should be go ahead. Um, you're speaking from the black hole, as I am. It's so inappropriate that I should be speaking from the black hole. I'm saying that very calmly and very coolly, and it's so not okay. It is so shameful that you do not want to see my face after two years. I'm very quiet. I'm whispering right now. I'm whispering here. I see your face. Take your own video images off if you want to play fair. This is serious. Two years. Zoom bombing. Come on, get off it. That's not the reason. You don't want to see me. Well, I don't want to see you either. So despicable. So inappropriate. You don't want to know your public. You know how I met um, Nuria? Because she got on since the pandemic. She recognized my voice in public when I saw her. If we were on the street together, I would never know. She would never know who I was. You can't know your own public. Is that what you want? Now, East Boulder, you need to have a comprehensive analysis of each party's contribution. And you know what I'm gonna say, because I've said it 500 times at these meetings, of their contribution to parking, to library, to rec centers, to open space, to everything that they use, all the services that they use. And then you choose how many can live in Boulder according to how much, you know, you don't have to even make any decision. You don't even need a planning department anymore. You just have regulations that you have to meet on how many people you can have in your development. And you don't, there wouldn't be any more subsidies for all of this growth. East Boulder is a joke. Sure, you're gonna get more housing, you're gonna get more neighborhood 15 minutes. But guess what? Parking, like Mark was talking about, the way to solve parking is to get rid of people. And all you're doing is expanding and making the demand worse in an inelastic market, as your brother said, John, it, it, George said in today's letter, it, it does in an inelastic market, it doesn't change. There's no change in affordability. And you're just making more affordable businesses too. Same thing, those businesses need people. Those people can't afford to live here. Nobody can afford to live here anymore because you are subsidizing development too much. It's so simple. Thank you, Lynn. And I'm going to call one more time to see if anybody else would like to speak tonight regarding the East Boulder sub community plan. And we'll see if we have any hands. And I don't see any, Peter. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Cindy. And thank you to everyone who spoke uh, today during the public hearing portion. So let us begin. We have two key issues. I'm going to pull up my packet here. 
Um, if anyone has them in front of them and wants to read off the first one and get us rolling, that's great with me. Sarah, I see some motion. Yeah, I can read it. Um, okay. Does the draft, key issue number one is, does the draft East Boulder subcommunity plan adequately and appropriately address the key feedback themes from the 60% draft plan engagement window? So I have a framing uh, concept here uh, inspired by Sarah that um, it would be nice if we took a round and we uh, voice some of our uh, enthusiasm or support or positivity for all the work that is inside this, this plan and this project and the immense amount of uh, participation at all levels. And I thought that Peter Oweda's comment was, was one of the greatest things I could hear on my last planning board meeting that he felt that this was, in his eyes, a, a shining example of uh, civic engagement. Um, without saying, you know, anything more about that, just that he would say that and feel that. And, and some of the powerful things we heard today uh, from uh, various members was, um, it was very meaningful. So, you know, it, not to be sappy, but it is an honor to be able to work on these types of projects with the community. So, um, you know, Sarah, I pass it to you to, uh, to pass this baton along and, you know, you can put your, put your, everyone can put their items inside this as well, but let's maybe wrap it up in the beginning with something that we find positive. Thanks. I, I just thought it was a good idea that we start with what we are, what the things we think we're very supportive of, because there's so much work has gone into this plan. Um, so I'll start. Um, first of all, I think that this process makes a very strong case for future subcommunity and area planning. Um, as our departed um, uh, colleague Lupita said, we're the planning board, not the welcoming board. And the planning, planning is key to the individual projects that fit within any particular area or subcommunity. Um, I really appreciate the responsiveness to, from, by staff to our request uh, during the last meeting about uh, the types of developments that could happen in different areas. It really helps to clarify um, uh, uh, what was a, quite a bit vague, more vague um, back in July. Um, I appreciate the connections plan. Um, I thought that it was very interesting and it offers diverse options um, and I really appreciate that you've kept some uh, some um, industrial areas as industrial areas. Um, I think that's very important. Um, and I know that the members of the board, the current makeup of the board have talked quite a bit about the need to protect industrial zoning. Um, so I appreciate that some of that has been uh, maintained um, in this plan. So those are my, my positive comments about the plan. Um, Fantastic. Um, Lisa, David, Georgie, John, I'm going to go with Lisa. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a planner and I also have a strong background in communications and uh, community engagement, and public engagement. And when time allows and resources are, you know, available to be brought to bear, um, you can do really, really wonderful things like this. And it's always exciting to see um, and I think in addition to it, bringing in people who wouldn't otherwise be included, which in and of itself is a public good and, and deeply necessary. Um, so I was so excited to um, hear from some of our public speakers early on, and I, I hope we're able to bring more folks like that um, into the discussions. Uh, in addition to providing all of that, um, when we do this kind of, you know, area planning, I think, or, you know, it, it can really allow us to dig deep into issues in ways that we can't normally. Um, and I don't think that necessarily means that we always end up with completely different outcomes, um, but it can uh, really allow everyone to air their, uh, the things they're excited about, the things they're worried about, um, and at least feel that they have been heard um, and, that, and that, you know, what they have to offer on that or what they're concerned about um, is understood by everyone. And, and I think it can just make for a much nicer process. And um, at the end, and we'll see, we'll see how we do later today. But um, 
you know, or on things future in this area, but um, yeah, it, it can just make for a much more pleasant planning process. Um, although I think doesn't necessarily always completely change outcomes. Um, so yeah, I thank you so, so, so much to the community members, members of planning board, members of staff, everyone who's put work into this. And, you know, if we had unlimited staffing, which we don't, uh, and if we had unlimited funding and time, um, you know, it'd be wonderful to see this all over the place. I, I love when we get to do sub area planning and area planning. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else jump in? John. Yeah, as, uh, as uh, I think the member of planning board who has shown up at most of these meetings, I, I would just like to congratulate and thank Jean and Kathleen and, and uh, Jean again, both Jeans, uh, for, for their work. And I think it has been a, a huge challenge with uh, this particular area of town because so much of the land is owned by commercial uh, owners and developers and with relatively few residents. And so I think to uh, that, that's been to some degree reflected in, in the participation in the working groups. And uh, I think it's, it's unavoidable. People tend to show up with the land that they have a direct interest in. Um, but I, I think that uh, you, you, you've done a tremendous job here, and I congratulate you on, on what you've accomplished. You know, there's, there's all those things to quibble about. Uh, that's the, the name of the game, but I, I would like to congratulate you on, on your enthusiasm and success in making this move ahead. That was great. Besides the fact that you just invented a board game for planners called Quibble. Uh, Georgie. I'll keep mine short and sweet because I think I, I share the sentiments that were shared across um, my colleagues prior to me. Um, I, 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 in, in, in general, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be a part of a, 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 a planning process like this, that there's some real deep thought around and, and, um, and a lot of attention paid to all the different communities in, involved or impacted. Um, and uh, that, that, that's it. I mean, I think everyone else summed it up pretty well. So I appreciate um, all the work that staff has done and, and that the participants of the, uh, the working group have, have worked through as well. Thanks. Thank you, David. I am muted. Um, yeah, I'll repeat, uh, I, I won't repeat um, all of the things that I just heard that I agree with, which is everything. Uh, wonderful comments from everybody. Um, I will uh, mention for the public, um, uh, I, it's three in the morning here, for the public's benefit uh, that uh, we all got offered tours uh, without uh, violating open meetings in pairs with staff. So staff really took us on tours of this area. Uh, uh, multiple many tours and I got a special one because <laughs> of my schedule so thank you so much for that it really highlighted to me how the land uses are tailored to the areas it, it gives us a visual of of how these land use designations were kind of arrived at and what the vision is uh, and that's great uh, I, I think that um, it's clear that uh, the stamp area may be a good candidate for some of the things we've discovered with form-based code approaches uh, to, uh, for various forms. And so that that uh, kind of popped out. Um, I did see a lot of, you know, tying up of loose ends in the latest, uh, the 90% from the 60%. Uh, it's really come a long way. Um, the I was really impressed with the section on the possibility of the GID creation. There's been, so what happens, I think a lot of times uh, we, we do have such deep conversations that we try to solve things that may not be solvable within a, a subcommittee plan, like the entire missing middle question or, or whether we're gonna change impact fees and things like that. But the GID creation, if that were something that could actually address some things beyond what our current initiatives uh, address with things like community benefits and stuff. So I love that there was some thinking outside the box there and, and some really stretch uh, kinds of approaches in, in this version. Uh, and um, uh, 
Yeah, uh, so I, I've been involved, you know, as a, I've been following this uh, from the beginning and it's, uh, and it's wonderful to see uh, where it's come. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, looking at the images of 55th and Arapaho, um, I think it's on 55 or 38 of 255. It's just amazing. Uh, again, without quibbling over it, but all the times we've talked about that transit corridor and what that means. And to see this uh, is incredible. So I feel like there's been a lot of progress. And uh, that's my, you know, you know, I'll pass this back around and we can go deeper on issue one, uh, anyone who would like, uh, or we can go to issue two and, and wrap up items, uh, any other items we have inside that issue and, and any follow up. So uh, how do people feel about that? Thumbs up that we go to issue two. All right, let's do that. Um, Sarah, it looks like you have it up still right there. My mouse just froze on me. And so I can't, uh, I'm having trouble getting it back up. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, can you read issue two? Oh, I have oh, it. What revisions to the draft? Yeah. I can do it, sorry. What revisions to the draft East Boulder subcommunity plan for the 55th and Rappo Station Area Plan does planning board suggest the staff and city council to finalize the plan for adoption? Anyone like to take that one on first? And if we need it, Sarah, go ahead. And if we need um, any uh, slides yeah. up for that, uh, go ahead and let the staff know. So actually, if you pull up the slide uh, that's on page, I'm sorry, I have it pulled up on my computer, page 39 um, of the whole packet, which is page 28 of the, of the subcommunity plan packet. Um, is the one with the, the, it's this one, if you can see that. <laughs> yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is actually something I raised with, uh, on, on my little tour um, with staff. Thank you very much for that tour. The, um, the um, innovation Todd residential area that is, um, that sort of flows from old, Pearl South across Arapaho. Um, it struck me that um, that some of that area, particularly the the thank you, the area that is the areas that are closest to the Humane Society on the west side of 55th Street, and then again on the uh, east side of 55th, north of um, I guess that's Flatiron Parkway, that those actually uh, could be um, Parkside residential. I, I, I used to walk dogs at the Humane Society and those are all along, that. those areas are along the um, creek. And um, it, so I, I don't mean to be quite so specific about Parkside residential, but it, it seems to me like with this large area of housing um, being proposed, potential residential being proposed here, that you could actually create a, a, a real neighborhood that you don't necessarily need to have um, quite so much um, a potential ground floor business. Um, you you want to have some, obviously, but. Um, it seems to me that this is an that those parts of um, of this innovation Todd residential could actually be slightly smaller scale, much more um, housing oriented, but still within walking distance to the uh, ground floor services and stores offered in the the more dense um, innovation Todd uh, typography. Um, so that's a I just feel like this should be more of a more of a neighborhood with more housing opportunities for uh, that are family or multi generational, um, uh, and not worry quite so much about um, the um, having ground floor retail throughout that entire space.
great points. We've certainly gone around on the ground floor retail requirement in different ways, and uh, it's nice to see it really land here in, uh, in, in those comments. Is there any follow-up to Sarah's point? Uh, would anyone else like to? I know there'll be some embroidering at some point. Well, uh, I, I agree with Sarah. I also had a couple other comments that uh, aren't, aren't uh, related to that specific area. Maybe I can mention that. I think, I think that'd be great, John, thank you. Okay, um, and that is related to points that were made in previous uh, discussions with the 60% uh, completion also. Uh, and that is that although our area includes the airport and the Valmont power plant, uh, those really have not been addressed uh, as far as I can tell. And, and uh, we, discussed and encouraged that previously. And uh, uh, I, I still think that it would be reasonable to address those on a very rough and large scale um, because those are two extremely important facilities that are within our planning area and yet, and yet we haven't dealt with them. So I, I think that's a, something that still needs to be done. Could I ask, is there a reference to the those, uh, there is a reference to uh, Valmont uh, power station in the in the plan, uh, which is great. So I don't know, is, 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 were you thinking there should be something more than that reference since it hasn't been, we don't have a strategy to annex it yet and uh, or anything, but it is, it certainly is covered in the plan. Well, I, I think it is so vague at this point that it, uh, it isn't of much value. So I think additional detail in both of those uh, facilities would be appropriate. May I follow up on that, um, John, and you are part of the East Boulder, you know, part of this, this group. Um, to what extent do we have control over that? I'm thinking specifically Valmont, I don't think we own the site. So, so what kinds of um, more fine grain direction would you look for in terms of maybe, again, like I think I mentioned this in previous meetings, but it's not designated as such, but it's probably a super fun site. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm so, sure it is. Yeah, uh, so like I, I would be like, don't ever buy it, then you're on the chain of custody. Um, oh. You know, but like what, what, what would you look for? What would you hope for other than it might be nice to clean it up perhaps on someone else's time? No, I John did say yeah. rough. Rough. He didn't say fine grain, so don't feel like <laughs> No, this is this is aspirational at this point. But uh, I, I am painfully aware of the Superfund, you know, cleanup aspects and concerns. But uh, but we're supposed to be thinking long term uh, about what happens in in this area. And you're right; the city doesn't own it, but it doesn't own most of the land that we're dealing with in this plan. So I don't see that as a as a reason to avoid thinking aspirationally. Uh, well, it's not it's not annexed, though, right, it, right John? No, but uh, neither is San Lazaro. So right. so but that doesn't. You said, you said um, Yeah. Okay. And the and with respect to the airport, I'm I'm very aware also that uh, we have long term agreements with the FAA that limit limit what can be done within the next, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Uh, but we're supposed to be thinking longer term than that. And so uh, it seems appropriate to me to to be thinking about that in a coherent manner. And I I, I remember that the city transportation director uh, discouraged that when we uh, talked about it previously. But I, I regard that still as something we should be thinking about explicitly. And I'm not trying to say that it shouldn't be an airport far into the future, but we should think about it and explicitly decide that that is appropriate if that's what we want.
Sure, Jay. Thanks. Um, I, I agree with John's points specifically on the um, the airport. I'm, I'm not sure why that was removed completely from this process. Um, so I, I, I think it would make sense to explore. Um, but beyond, beyond that, I, I wanted to ask some, some pointed questions around um, Flatiron Business Park, just to understand that a little bit more. Um, because I understand that that housing isn't a component of that as proposed. Um, I wanted to understand that um, my understanding is there's about a million square feet that's currently built out there. Is that correct? Of office? Um, light I, don't have, I don't have, I don't know if Kalani, if you have access to that number in a quick way, I do not. I think that was what was just quoted in the yeah. article. Yeah, so I, wa okay. I wanted to understand that and what their maximum build out is of office and light industrial. Um, and I wanna balance that with the housing needs of the area. My understanding is that Flatiron Business Park, which is it's kind of new information to this project, right? I mean, this project has been a three-year project. In the meanwhile, um, there's been an acceleration in the business community and commercial community. Um, that's been pretty significant. So I don't know if it's been consummated yet, uh, but there's a transaction that's slated um, for someone out of state to be buying that for about 600 plus million dollars. Um, and there's new construction going on in there. Uh, so I think it's important for us to understand what its maximum freight is um, as far as because that $600 million from a commercial standpoint doesn't make a lot of economic sense with the existing tenants um, and existing square footages of commercial. And so trying to understand what that new buyer sees as it relates to expansion opportunity, but also the pressures that that will put under rents, um, not only there, but across this area and how we account for that in this project so that we can maintain affordability for the existing businesses that are here. Um, but we also are properly housed for it. So I'm, I'm, I'd am I'm like to get a little bit more granular. This is, this is kind of a, a detailed question around why housing wouldn't be appropriate here um, and, and wh why that is, that that's been positioned that way. Yeah, I can talk to that a little bit. Um, so, you know, when we looked at Flatiron Business Park and really thought about the surrounding uses, um, thought about the floodplain in the area, there were a lot of constraints and challenges to being able to really create a neighborhood in that space. And um, thinking about how we're creating neighborhoods in these different areas across the subcommunity it just it just wasn't like a great match there was no real inspiration in our in our working group or among staff to be able to say yeah this is going to be a great place for housing and so the approach to flatiron business park um, you know everything kind of east of what what we've identified as that 55th street corridor really remains business oriented and the idea of mixed use is being able to incorporate things that would support that network of businesses so being able to bring in new retail um, dining and entertainment um, as a way to support those uses but also you know reduce trips in the area overall because we know that people um, that work in flatiron business park today are leaving every day to go get lunch or do their shopping, things like that. So that, that's part of what's envisioned for the um, mix there. We do have a um, section along um, Central. I can pull up the map because it's easier for me to talk to. Let me pull that back up. Are you seeing the map? Great. So um, we do have a section along Central here that's identified for that Main, main Street Live Work place type. Um, and that was really the, 
the one kind of stretch of the area where we have this adjacency of um, the bike path. It's a little bit um, quieter, I would say, you know, this whole area is, I think, really impacted by um, a lot of the noise of trucks going over um, the bridge here and activity at Western Disposal, but there's some kind of buffer in this area where we thought um, that could put, have more potential for residential. And um, the other thing about the parcel sizes here was that contributed to why we um, chose that Main Street Live Work um, designation because it, it sort of had the right parcel size and shape to accommodate what we're envisioning for that place type. Does that, is that helpful? Yeah, that, that's helpful. I think um, just as a, as a follow-up, not for necessarily now, but to understand sort of what the square footages are today versus what max build out looks at that. Because um, like I said, it's being purchased for an obscene amount of money that doesn't make financial sense on the current rents. Um, there, there's rumored high-tech tenants that are, are going in there. Um, and it's also rumored that rents are about to increase by somewhere between 10 and $30 a square foot there between um, cam charges and additional rents to justify all this. And so there's, there's, there's gonna be a concerted effort to, to potentially build that place out to maximize it, to get a return on investment. And I think the community needs to understand that because um, the sub-community plan is great and it is like an enhancement for, it becomes an amenity for this business park. And I want to make sure from a planning perspective that we've accounted for the amenity that's being created for this business park and that the economics are ultimately linked potentially to its expansion so that we get it right as a community and don't create less affordability as a result of this by something that we may not fully understand. Um, thank you. Could I just ask a follow-up because it'll help me prepare, um, prepare some of the information. When you, um, when you say max, build out when you're asking for those numbers, did you want us to um, give you like the total square footage for this this type of blue box across Flatiron Business Park? Or well, it would be, it'd be ideal to, to understand sort of, yeah, the entitled, the entitled build out of that okay. location. Okay. Because I have a strong sense that this plan, while, while, while awesome, is is potentially an enticement to build this out faster, um, especially because of that investment being made. So um, to understand that, and then to make sure that our housing goals are properly balanced against that, and that the economics are not just eluding the city of Boulder, um, I think it are, is important uh, for everyone to understand. Thank you. Great, thanks, that's helpful. Can I just add an addendum to what George just said, which is in addition to the square footage, then using that formula that you had that you brought up before about square footage equals equaling or defining jobs. I think it would be because that's a key part of this equation that the city's going to have to figure out. Um, right, right now, the um, the I think it's um, 3,500, 4,000 additional housing units. Is that right? Dwelling units? 5,000. Um, and uh, an unknown number. Right now, the known number of additional jobs is something like 4,000, but we don't know what the potential number of jobs would be in the maximal. And I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, but the maximal build out in this. Uh, in, in this Flatirons Park, that would be a helpful number as well. Right. 
Cindy, um, John, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I think uh, Mark McIntyre brought up some excellent points uh, in his comments in the uh, public hearing about uh, parking and how it's addressed. And uh, that made a lot of sense to me. And I'd just like to encourage you to pay attention to the, to the points he brought up uh, uh, because I, I agree with them. Cindy, will our comments in the record serve as the indication to council uh, and staff? Obviously, we're not going to summarize this in a you know anything like a motion. So I'm assuming that it's on the record. Okay. Uh, yes, they will. Thank you, uh, David. I see you have your hand up, and then Sarah. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, echo John's comments. I, I think that when we do have uh, words, even if you know, obviously we can't necessarily uh, solve all of the some principles in the in the plan, but if we have words in there that can help us uh, have criteria that we can then reference uh, when we're looking at development projects, that's great. So uh, yeah, uh, words to that effect would be useful. I, uh, I think that there are a lot of things in here that will add <laughs> a lot of great criteria for these areas. So, um, so, so just in general, I think that's good. Um, yeah, I guess that's all. Um, oh, and just on that flat irons thing, the um, last time we looked at this in June, it was all mixed use industrial. So actually, um, is that right, uh, Kathleen? And, and so actually we've kind of added a strip that can be residential along that levee area to the so east. So the land use designation is mixed use industrial. And then the map mm. we were just looking at is that oh, place types map. So that kind of maps. breaks down and, and differentiates. Thanks. The, yeah, the I was, forms and things. I was uh, at this late hour, I was getting confused between those two. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Oh, oh um, and one, if I could, uh, Peter, just one, one other question. Um, on the Richard Johnson question uh, with uh, uh, the one address on Valmont, uh, is that something that you're considering, you know, since it's just one property, I don't know if it would make, <laughs> I mean, it might be more in line with, with our uh, desires to have it zoned Parkside residential, honestly, uh, but um, have you thought of that? Yeah, so um, we worked with our Parks and Recs staff and um, folks from Community Vitality uh, back when we were thinking about how the concept for Valmont City Park um, could play out over time. And so part of the reason for keeping that community business designation is the idea that there might be some park serving retail in that space in the future. And so that, that was the intention for that um, land use designation. Thanks. I, I, I wondered what that was. Great. Sarah? So first, I'd like to thank David Ensign for being up at 3.30 in the morning in Iceland. I'm, your commitment to planning board responsibilities is, is impressive, I have to say. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Sarah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I'm always, I'm always up for that last final push. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, which one actually plays off, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes over on a different laptop, so I apologize for looking away all the time. Um, this actually relates to, in, in a different way to what David was just talking about, that one particular parcel. Um, so as I said uh, the earlier, I'm really grateful that um, as part of this plan, you've left some industrial zones untouched and would just like to put out on the table something that I know has already been talked about um, in a separate conversation, and I can't remember when, um, that this might lead to um, changing, um, that the, I, I would recommend that we, that the staff think long and hard in a positive way about changing the contiguity regulation. I, I actually got the code 9-6-4F2 
which is conditional use review standards and residential development and industrial zoning. And the language now says location within the industrial districts, dwelling units in those districts may be constructed if location on a parcel that has not less than one sixth of the perimeter of the parcel contiguous with the residential use that includes one or more dwelling units or, or is contiguous to a residential zone or to a city or county owned park or open space. And I just think in order, at least for the length of the implementation process of this plan, the 20 year plan, I think it would make sense to consider strongly eliminating that one six contiguity allowance and instead and making sure that we're protecting the industrial zones that are left untouched for 20 years. And we can revisit it later, but to me, that's a, an important step for us to consider. Um, a second item, so when we had talked about um, uh, the community benefit phase two challenge of affordable commercial space and affordable space for arts and nonprofits, um, one of the ideas that was put on the table was to maybe create a, uh, a building um, somewhere in the East Boulder subcommunity um, that would be specifically an arts and nonprofit space. And I'm wondering if as part of the this process, that might be something that could be considered for the stamp area. Um, that obviously there's gonna be a lot of jobs there. Um, there's gonna be, a, I think a little bit of housing. I just don't remember right off the top of my head. Um, and it's going to be a location, assuming that the transit actually goes in, where people from different parts of the county can come. And, and it seems to me like that's a, a viable um, location for, think of it as dairy part two, you know, where it could really be a, a cultural hub for, for the area. Um, so that's a thought I had. And then... Um, 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 oh, tree canopy, my favorite topic, um, free range trees um, versus graded trees. Um, there were some areas, some typologies that had pretty limited tree canopy proposed. And um, I, I um, obviously in terms of our climate, the tr um, tree canopy is important for reducing or heat or urban heat island effect and also being a carbon sink. And I just would really like to make sure that in every single one of these typologies, there's a real commitment to um, a tree planting um, that is sustainable. So not trees that are gonna be put in grates and can last for seven years and then have to be replaced with little stick trees, um, but trees that can really grow and, 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 and be an amenity as well as a carbon sink. Um, okay, those were my thoughts. Thank you. I'd like to jump in and echo that point Sarah made. Uh, I totally agree. It's a, it is a chance to achieve one of those community benefit goals that we struggled with uh, uh, around this kind of art and nonprofit space like the Alliance Center in Denver. Um, I like that idea of dairy too, and the idea of you know, an actual children's museum in Boulder and following on you know what the Junkyard Social Club has begun doing uh, just across the way uh, to the west. And it is an opportunity to create that uh, sense of place and gravity there around um, the things that you know have always made Boulder great and that you know will inevitably find, have a hard time finding a toehold in the rent and purchase environment. So uh, I'd love to get echo of Sarah's comments, get that on the record as well. All right, well, we have gone around a few times and I feel like uh, members of this board who will live on uh, and the new ones will have another, another shot at this as well. So uh, unless anyone has anything else major that they need to get on the record now, I see Jean has her hand up, so I'll actually stop talking and pass it to Jean. Thanks, Peter. I just wanted to jump in. I've been trying to take notes in terms of identifying the things where we need, where you've requested either follow up additional analysis, um, and then other things where it seems like there were suggestions about revisions. So 
um, we might need to clarify a few of those and exactly what folks are looking for. So under follow-up and additional analysis, I have information about the job projections in Flatirons Business Park and a, a lot more detail on that. And um, Kathleen, let me know if you think that we need further detail on what we're, what we're looking for there. I think, yeah, I think it would be helpful to know um, when you're thinking about that information, like what do we want to do with it? Because it would, um, are you thinking that when we start to look at that maximum build out and think about the jobs numbers, you might want to change a land use designation or you might want to change a place type um, because that can help me kind of put together options if that's what's on the table or if it's more um, let's let's look at those jobs numbers and let's look at those square footages so we can talk about how to um, manage trips or um, think about parking it you know it's like how are we going to use the information to make changes to the plan um, knowing that will really help me provide you with the right information so I was I was one of the two people that chimed in on that specifically. So I'll, I'll give you my perspective. I, I don't want to create work just to create work. I think that the, the key is to understand the jobs and square footage there today and the potential, the, the max potential under that, under what we have in place uh, for what that will become. Um, and with the intent of that informing us um, that we're making the right decision on housing and if they're and potentially looking at housing opportunities there or elsewhere to compensate for that in one form or another. Um, so that was that was sort of the flavor of where I was going just because of this most recent information that doesn't necessarily jive and the existing square footage is there. Um, so that would be that would be helpful because I, I think something is eminent that's going to happen there. Got it. Thank you. Can I just add to, add to what George said? So I you you asked the question so clearly, Kathleen. Like, what would we do with what would we want to do with that information? And I think it might lead to a conversation about um, uh, re rejiggering some of the typologies um uh to uh, make sure that the jobs and a uh, housing jobs and housing numbers are not um separating so much that we're exacerbating a problem more than we might um that's that's i think how i would likely use use that information Thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. And if we need, Kathleen, if you need more, then we can just keep circle back. Um, I see also examples of mixed use industrial that are somewhat comparable to what we might expect. Um, so some um, little bit of examples of, of where we've seen that otherwise. Um, data. Can I just add to that, Jean? Sure. Um, and you're probably already thinking of this, but certainly it would be nice to see examples within the city of Boulder. But if you could come, come up with examples in the metro area or even further abroad, you know, it would just be nice to maybe have something we could walk or drive through if we or bike through if we chose to, um, or at least do like a Google fly through or something, you know, to just get a sense of it. Okay. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, data on overall emissions analysis and variables. I had noted aggregate um, basis for emissions. George, you probably had better words than that. Um, well, it was uh, it was specifically related to this slide on per capita emissions and how that was calculated. So we could just understand that. And then um, like to get the aggregate projections as well, um, since it should be the same, just the same calculation divided by people. It would be helpful to understand that. Great. And then um, on uh, some of the comments around potential revisions or, or things to consider for the plan, 
Um, Sarah had raised the area around uh, 55th to Parkside Residential. And I think what I'd like to understand is, is that is there, um, how, how much of, how many of the board members would like to see us work through a different um, scenario on that or what would be helpful to understand on that? Which area were we talking about there? Um, I can pull um, it up. It's the, it's the, um, how the, it's called Innovation Todd Residential. It's the soft pink area that sort of goes along 55th Street and crosses over the trail station, the ra railroad station, and then into the stamp area. So yeah, I, um, personally, I thought that was the correct designation for this area. So I would not necessarily be all that warm on trying to designate that park side, but I don't know what others think. No, and I, I wasn't proposing the whole thing be designated park side. I was proposing that some of the, they're not quadrants, but some of the areas um, be designated park side uh, so that you had, um, A, you took advantage of the park side. Yeah, so right where those, yeah, those, exactly, those two yeah. in particular. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, also just to create an area where there's less industrials or less office and industrial and more really residential so that there are places that are basically residential, um, still hot more density than uh, what we might have in our neighborhoods to the west, but um, so that's what I was thinking. Well, uh, Jean, you asked if other members uh, agree with Sarah on, on that suggestion, and, and I do. Well, I'm, I'm not warm. Uh, what do others think? I, I mean, I, I feel like there was a lot of thought put into that particular area around 55th Street, so and it looked pretty reasonable to me given the fact that we were looking at a lot of business oriented uh, areas right now. And uh, so, you know, it seemed to make sense, but maybe, maybe I'm in the minority on that. I feel like when there are always chances for us to iterate and improve things. And in this particular case, I, I think the work's already been done. Um, so if there's, strong feeling across the board that more needs to be done. Um, we need to direct staff to do that then okay, but I, I don't see a need. I pretty much echo Lisa's uh, uh, either or uh, position and David's for the record. Perhaps what I can propose is that as we start, since you know that is adjacent to the Flatirons Business Park and probably um, some of the other issues uh, that we would be looking at in terms of the build out, we can just take another look at that and see if there feels like there are um, good reasons to suggest some changes to what Sarah um, describes and. Um, pull some of that thinking into the further analysis. Does that sound right, Kathleen? Yeah, I think um, the other, just for sort of background on um, the site testing that we did, we did um, kind of look at that originally for Parkside Residential and we got a lot of pushback from um, colleagues in open space. The, the green space that's there um, is a rehabilitated habitat that has had a lot of investment. And so the idea that that green space would be um, accessible or that we would encourage people um, to use it as part of their kind of like front yard in the way that we have for the other Parkside residential neighborhoods um, was opposed, I think, by, by our open space staff. So that that's just a little background on that. 
Can I just, how are you going to keep people from using how, I, I mean, whether it's Parkside Residential or Neighborhood Todd or Innovation Todd Residential, how would you keep people from using that green space in exactly that way? Well, there are recommend, you know, they did ask us to incorporate recommendations in the plan for um, the future about fencing that area. But what it really does is that Parkside Residential considers the green space adjacency in what, um, what those um, minimums or yeah, minimums for usable open space would be. And so in the innovation TOD, we might have a different requirement for usable open space on the actual developable site because we're not getting any kind of accessible outdoor space for the new residents in that area. Okay, thanks for explaining that. So, sorry, I just wanna follow up on that, Kathleen. So by not, um, so by kind of leaving that potentially, perhaps it's protectable, perhaps it's not, I think Sarah's point is excellent. Um, it actually increases the, the need for um, on-site increased open space for anything developed near it as opposed to decreasing it. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I wanted to note um, John's comment about potentially more detail um, added to the sections that do uh, outline the future steps for the airport or Belmont power plant, noting that um, there are other processes and definitely um, ownership issues that will dictate the long, longer term future of those. We have been, um, you know, those are topics that um, are pretty complex. And I think trying to understand, um, John, you, you elaborate a little bit more about what what additional detail you might be looking for. Um, Kathleen, thoughts on what on trying to clarify that with other board members on what we'd like to see or what we think is is feasible for those areas of what we can include in the plan. Yeah, I think I, I don't I don't necessarily have clear direction on um, what next step you might be suggesting for for language about the airport um, and you know that what what we describe for the airport in a you know this plan has a 20 year horizon and so we're looking at how we will plan for and use the space in East Boulder for the next 20 years. Um, the airport master plan project is coming up in 2024 and that will take a deeper dive into, um, you know, redevelopment of the terminal or, um, you know, the different buildings and components that are at the airport. So I guess I, I'm not clear on on whether you want us to consider a land use change there or just what type of language you would like to add to the, to that section in particular. Well, I you know, I as I as I mentioned before, I don't it's not that I'm trying to change the airport uh, function or use or or anything like that, but given its significance in this area and our objective of dealing with all large uh, large pieces of land in the area at, at some level, I think it would be appropriate for us to uh, begin to, to address that. And uh, it may be that we just make a recommendation that the airport should continue. And I am perfectly okay with that. But, uh, but it seems to me that there should be some explicit discussion of that. Got it. And I, I might mention it, uh, at the same time, I've been contacted by some folks at the airport who were worried about, uh, you know, navigation uh, over, over, over the East Boulder area 
and uh, potential residential development in an area where they start getting harassed by people complaining about tow planes, towing gliders, and uh, so on over there. So uh, uh, I think they are sort of worried about uh, their future in some some extent also. Yeah, I can just um, that that's that's really helpful. And I'll just mention we're meeting with some folks um, at the airport in the next couple of weeks to um, hear and, and talk about their concerns. So I've had my hand up for a while on this. Can I chime in? Uh, I uh, would strongly oppose delaying the uh, the final product of this uh, plan in order to accommodate any sort of uh, manipulations around our future for the airport. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of ideas out there, uh, but um, anything that we do that really tries to uh, speculate could raise serious alarms and cause uh, uh, real problems getting this thing finalized. So uh, if, if a general section can be added, kind of like what uh, the power plant section, because the power plant section does a very good job of saying, you know, that there's uh, hazardous waste, or, you know, issues to clean up issues to be addressed. Um, we had a great project from CU students on that, that really had great vision for it, that would be lovely. And that's there to fold in. So I think we can put placeholders in for the airport and for the power plant that just kind of acknowledge that they are in this, uh, but then also don't try to uh, step in to presuming what the future is going to be at this point. So uh, because I just feel like if we start to do that, uh, yes, it will delay this plan. And, uh, and I think there's, this is way too important to just start delaying because we know that, you know, <laughs> there's, there's some possible visions out there that we can work out in the future. So placeholders and, you know, um, uh, subcommittee plans can be updated. Uh, there can be a, an update in five years with, with more on the airport or more on the power plant. Power plant. I, I agree. I presume John was bringing it up just because it, it's, it required, it, some reference, not that he's holding, that wouldn't want to hold this hostage in order to litigate the pros and cons of the airport. Um, but I agree with John that it's great to mention it. I like the way you uh, framed it, David, that it can be referenced the way the power plant is, but in no way should it uh, you know, be some kind of poison pill that we're you know holding anything up because we're gonna resolve the airport conundrum right now. Thank you, Peter. That sums it up well. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, last couple things. Uh, potential revisions. Words about the SUMP, this uh, uh, shared, unbundled, managed, and paid principles. Revisiting um, the place types to ensure that they address sustainable tree canopy. And then um, there were a couple mentions about the art or nonprofit space. And that sounded a little bit like uh, looking for a location for a city facility, but I'm not, I, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure. I think I'm uh, reading something, some into those comments and would no, like it was, to it was, um, I don't know if it would be a city owned facility, uh, but the opportunity, what is there an opportunity at the stamp site for there to be uh, one parcel or a part of a parcel or something that could um, be, maybe you do it as a public private partnership, um, a, uh, that to try to address the um, commercial affordability challenge for nonprofits and arts groups um, that we struggled with during phase two of community benefit. Um, and may, it may, given that this is a high level 30,000 foot view, does it make sense to add to the discussion of stamp the question of or the opportunity for such a facility? And then how that gets implemented is just as much of an unknown as all of the other things that are unknown in the implementation of this, like zoning. <laughs> Great, okay. That's super helpful. 
Okay, that's what I have on my list. What am I missing? Am I missing other things that we need to um, either provide some more analysis on or further explore potential revisions um, to the draft? Um, Sarah had mentioned some specific um, revisions um, and I got, I got the one on page 65. That's it. That's an easy, quick fix. Um, and then just wanted to check with the group about um, the contiguity regulation for conditional okay. use review standards and make sure that um, folks are in agreement about that one. At least revisiting it. It's something actually that Carl Geiler has already brought up um, mm -hmm. in another meeting. And I, sorry, I can't remember which one. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I, there was one other thing um, in the implementation on page 65 in the implementation section, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned expand community benefit program to develop a menu of incentives. And that's listed as a number two priority. And I'm wondering yeah. if that should not shouldn't be a number one priority, because um, if the if development of the stamp site is so important, then then figuring out what the incentives should be seems to me like a a, a top priority. But that's just that's without understanding how you what criteria you use to determine what was what what were oh, number one, number two, or number three priority. Oh. That's a really good point. They're, they do um, represent kind of a, does it say it in here? Oh yeah. So on page 70, um, each, it, it says each recommendation includes a priority ranking. One indicates near-term implementation, which is in the next five years. Priority two plans for implementation in the next five to 10 years. So I guess that raises the question. I, mm -hmm. is, I'm assuming the stamp site is like the highest and maybe i'm wrong i just sort of assumed it was the highest priority because it is sort of an anchor for everything else yeah i think from our perspective we're considering that to be a really catalytic site for the whole sub community and would um, prioritize in our work plan looking at rezoning of that area or looking at form based code for that area as a near-term project so then would the incentives for redeveloping that area also be a, top, a number one Gary. priority? Yeah. Sarah, was that a qu question or statement? I'm sorry, I got, I didn't hear exactly. It was a, it was a, a thought <laughs> for you right. all to take on as you wish. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, this was, this was super helpful. And thank you all for bearing with us for the clarification on those pieces. Thank you for coming back around and checking in on all those items. I think that really was helpful to, to make sure that we, even though it kept me up to actually 3.30, like Sarah said, ha, ha, ha. Okay, well, thank you, Jean. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you everyone else on staff who is a part of this and the working group and the public and all of you. Can I say a, a word? Please do. Um, I just want to say when I was in my first year on planning board, um, I went, I was at the Boulder Farmers Market and I noticed Jean staffing an Alpine Balsam booth and uh, I walked over and there was kind of an angry person, like just angry at everything about Boulder. And I just remember how Jean's uh, special touch on community outreach really uh, really just turned this person around from being so angry to just like talking constructively. And uh, uh, so um, I talk about the gold standard of community outreach and I think you really have uh, shown us that Gene and I'll, um, 
and uh, your, what you said earlier tonight also about the connector program and everything. Uh, so we'll miss you and uh, um, I wish you all the best. And I'll uh, invite other board members to chime in if anybody else has a favorite gene memory. It's fun, funny, David, it's almost as if we were at the same farmer's market, but I, this was maybe Creek Fest five years ago, and I remember seeing Gene under a 10 by 10 pop-up tent by the Canyon uh, Library entrance talking to people, and that was one of my first memories, and thank you for all the work and for guiding us along on all this. Thank you. Congratulations on a new chapter. Thank you. Lisa. I was lucky enough to um, get to work with Jean prior to being on planning board as a member of staff. Um, and she is equally wonderful on the other side. Um, yeah, I don't know how many internal meetings you facilitated, not only external community engagement, but all of it. And you always bring a, um, a very sincere and heart heartfelt calmness to the room, <laughs> um, which I absolutely loved. It's, it's good energy, you have very good energy to be a little bolder about it. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very, very lucky that we had you and whoever gets to have you next is also incredibly lucky and um, don't be a stranger. Come, come bug us sometimes, you know, if, I don't think you, I haven't seen it in you, but I, maybe it's hidden, you know, if, if you feel like you need to come complain at us in a meeting, I think you've more than earned it. And, um, you know, <laughs> feel free to show back up <laughs> on the other side. Well, I, I can, it seems like I've spent more time with Jean than any other member of city staff. Somehow all the meetings I go to, you're there. And uh, I just want to say thanks a million. I think you've done a fantastic job and good for you. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you all. As you know, it's like, it's been my honor and privilege to serve the community of Boulder. And I have learned so much from all of my amazing colleagues and from all of the members that have served on this board and and kudos to David and Peter um, as your last meeting too. I'm sure that um, you all will be doing wonderful things for the city um, as you continue as, as non-planning board members. Um, I, I'm a, I, I don't know what else to say, but, but thank you so much for your kind words and, and to all of my colleagues, the opportunity to get to work on amazing projects like this one. This has been so, a dream team of um, stellar colleagues and stellar community members. Um, so, very nice. Jean, what are you gonna do with your Thursday nights? Hard to say. Drink, drink heavily, go party, <laughs> go, go for a run. <laughs> nah. I'll send you a link. <laughs> but yeah, I would also like to thank uh, David and Peter for your service uh, to the city of Boulder for all of these years. You, you're, you're part of the reason why this community continues to be a special place and of course welcoming our new board members, ML Robles and Mark McIntyre and uh, Laura Kaplan, I think that they're going to be a great addition to our to the conversation as well. And then finally, Jean, you know, I, I met Jean, it's been over 25 years ago, um, when she was, um, I believe, a person who went by the name of Jean Hagen, and she uh, was an intern with the uh, with, with the long, long range planning division. And, and it's just been wonderful to both work with you and watch you grow as a planner. And um, I do think that, you know, one of the things that has, you know, as we talk about this project, as we're trying to get it pushed across the finish line, that you've always been important to um, how we engage with our community. Um, and it just seems like you're going out kind of taking it to the next level. So. Um, thank you. And, and like I said, you know, I'll feel, feel free to come back. <laughs> and David and Peter, how are you all feeling? And an honor. It's been a 
you know, I say that it's been uh, one of the highest honors uh, to be able to do this for Boulder. There's, you know, no reason, no, no reason to complain about how the experience was altered because the whole world was altered. Um, I, and I do regret not being able to spend time in person and having those moments in the break room before and during and after meetings. Um, but I'm glad I got to have those moments. And then I got to have the Zoom meetings, which allowed for a certain amount of freedom and flexibility and being you know, in your own home. So I think mostly just uh, learning from each of you things that I've taken uh, you know, into my own personal and work life and a, a, a stand. I was I was terrified at the very beginning that I wouldn't be able to stay awake, uh, and that's never that's probably only been a problem once or twice. It wasn't because of the content, um, but it just shows how engaging it is to be working with people, and when we get into it, and uh, it's always fun because we're all coming from a place of really caring, and. I, I, I'm, I'm really proud of, of all of us getting through uh, a couple of difficult moments that were beyond getting into it uh, because they veered off a bit. And um, we, uh, we, we kept all four wheels on the road just barely, uh, but we did. And that's all that matters. Um, so that was, I was proud of us for that, I think, because um, there were tough times and we didn't even, you know, we all knew what was going on in the world and with ourselves and with our board. And we, we kept doing our job. So I think that's great. It's been an honor to work with each of you tonight. I look forward to spending time with each of you in some other way too. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll just uh, say that uh, it also for me, it's been quite an honor and uh, uh, really um, just um, wonderful to, learn about uh, all the ways that things work in the public sphere and how to how to listen to our community members and try to really hold the interests of all our community members as we try to move forward and uh, realize of course you can't uh, you, you're never going to be able to uh, give everybody everything but really just trying to be as uh, as in tune to the needs of the community as possible uh, and to work with um, such incredible uh, city staff has been uh, great. Uh, so uh, thanks for thanks for teaching us about urban planning and uh, working with us. And uh, I see Helen there, all the legal things that we've learned. And Cindy's uh, kept us all steered in the right direction. David, thank you for leading the team. Uh, it was it's been uh, it's been really really wonderful, wonderful ride. So I'll miss it all, but uh, hopefully um, we can, I think that we should be able to schedule a dinner for that includes the last couple of rotating off people, uh, Brian and Harmon at some point, because- uh, oh, I'm totally uh, doing that. I'm I think that, that uh, I think COVID is, uh, is sort of- uh, <laughs> Don't jinx us, David. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what a beautiful experience to have those members who didn't get that physical send off and then to include the new members because that's something that I- And the new members too. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice. just wonderful to have everybody in the, in the room. That's some knowledge it, transfer right there. It's on my to-do list to schedule that for all of us. Oh, great, excellent. Good luck. Mm. All right, well, do we have matters? Dis uh, disposition, Cindy. Bring us back have, on track for a minute. I have one little matter, just something for you to think of, uh, about. We don't really have to have a discussion about it right now, but just something to think about that our next board meeting will be on April 7th and it will include our new board members. And at the top of the meeting, we'll be swearing them in, but then also we will be needing to possibly um, elect a new chair and vice chair. So I just kind of want you to start thinking about that. Um, thinking about what you want to do. I, we don't miss, I do think we have to elect a new chair and vice chair at the next meeting that Hella is, looks like she's about ready to speak, but it's just something we, Hella and I kind of talked about this and we thought we need 
This wouldn't put a bug in your ears, so you need to start thinking about it. But Hella, go ahead. Yeah, when, when Cindy and I were talking about it, we thought either you could elect a new chair at the beginning of the next meeting, or you could potentially just select an interim chair so that somebody knows that they're going to be chairing the next meeting and, and can prepare for that today and then follow that up with a more permanent chair selection when the new board members are on board. So it's up to you. Any thoughts? I know last year it was simpler because we had a vice chair that was staying so the vice chair could start the meeting and then you do you launch into the voting but you know anyway just an observation yeah john do you, john, do you want to be the temporary and then we'll vote on it in on next week i'd, I'd be happy to i i just wanted to mention a, a small problem i have and that is I'm supposed to be going camping next week, and I'm intending to come down and look for a motel that has internet service so I can, <laughs> I can join the meeting. Uh, but there's that slight chance that it won't work out like that. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll make it a point that I will find internet service somewhere. <laughs> so, okay. That's very nice of you. Thank you, John. Yeah. John, I'll go drink all your beer at your campsite. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's well, all I have. Thank you, That's Cindy. Thank you, Thank you, everyone else. If that wait, is wait, 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 wait. Sarah. Okay. Do we yet know when we're coming back in person? What I can tell you, um, I have some dates here. Um, so uh, April 19th, um, the council will be in chambers um, to discuss going back in person. Okay. May 15th, they are scheduling right now to have to allow public in city council at that city council meeting. Um, we still cannot do anything until council does it. So that being said, I have not been trained on anything as far as equipment, technology. So that needs to be done first. Um, so I am, but that is starting next month, <laughs> April. Um, so my guess is we had a big meeting about it today. My guess is we think probably June is when we can, probably our first meeting in June is when we can discuss as a board and I can report to you, okay, council's doing it, it's working. I have been fully trained on how to work the equipment how does the board feel like they want to proceed? Because we do need to decide as a board what we want to do. I can tell you this, city council study sessions are forever and will always be virtual. Hmm. Their meetings are going to be, and we are not going, we are trying to stay stray away from the word hybrid. So we are not going to be using that word. We're, it is going to hopefully be a mix of in-person and virtual, but there seems to be, we wanna get away from that word hybrid because we can't get a definition of it, <laughs> essentially is what's happening. And so, um, but long and short, that was a long answer to your question. I am thinking that in June is when we can return. Okay. So May 15th city council meeting is when they are projecting that public can actually be at a city council meeting. If all goes smooth and well, then board secretaries can start doing their training and working on it and figuring out how do we do it? How do, can we make it work? And then I would think June, we can do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, John. Yeah, 
Did we make a decision that since council is meeting on Thursdays that we're going to do it on Tuesdays? And when does that start? We are doing it on Tuesdays and we start after recess. So our first Tuesday meeting will be July. I see. 20, anyway, July 19th will be our first Tuesday meeting. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, this might, yeah, I was just gonna say that, and I don't want to keep David up too much longer. Um, but that I don't want to make this decision without our new planning board members in, but it might make sense to kind of figure out what we're going to do in person and which ones we might or might not do remote kind of along with that switch to Tuesdays or something like that. Um, so I don't want to push it out if someone's really, you know, eager to be back. And I am excited to see all of you um, in person, but it might just be nice to kind of do the transition all at once after recess is one way we might address it. Um, and then also without going too far down the line, um, I think I, I think it would be nice for us and also for the public to maybe follow council's lead and have like the first meeting of the month is always in person and the second one's always remote. And then if we have a third, I don't know what we do. Um, you know, but something like that might be an interesting compromise. So that's, that's just throwing it out there. Compromise. I think that as a board, they are asking that each board discuss it and figure out what they want to do. And um, I think that'd be great. It's your decision. So, yeah. Nice background, David. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> All right. With that, nice handoff there. Nice <laughs> one. Uh, I'm going to gavel us out. Well, Bye. thank you. Bye. Thank you, David. Bye, Bye. Bye David. Sleep well. Safe thank travels. You, thank thank you. you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Talk to Bye, you soon. Peter. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.